So uh, happy Earth Day. I mean, you should be the one saying that. <laughs> happy Earth Day, my fellow Earthlings. And uh, welcome to our uh, Earth Day. Hello here live from sunny Ventura, California. And uh, we have two days of amazing presentations, not only speakers and music, but we'll be enjoying in some uh, prayer, some ceremony, and also some films. So um, I'm your host for the weekend and tech coordinator, uh, producer Michael DiMartino. And uh, I'm here to introduce our, our first guest, but also to do a, an appropriate <clears throat> introduction and opening for this whole uh, Earth Day broadcast. And of course, we'll be continuing into tomorrow. One of the uh, co-founders of Earth Day and uh, the head of Green to Gold and hundreds of green tentacles all around the world doing amazing work. I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Alan Chatner. So welcome. Thank you, Michael. I, I can't appreciate you more than for putting this whole production on for us. Two days that are going to be exciting and ex extremely informational. And we're going to show things that are about solutions to the problems of the world. And you coined that phrase, solutionaries. And we're going to really going to rock with solutionaries, every type. And in, in, in this is a regenerative thing. You brought that to us in a big way. Regenerative in every way, not just for the planet, but it's also for the human well-being and nutrition and uh, our ability to function and interact with fellow human beings and all the species and the planet, uh, the plants on the planet, everything. We want to show how we can regenerate solutions that will make a big difference in what I hope to see is a global, inclusive, green economy for everyone that will lift the economic development for those countries that are trying to achieve sustainability and also make us that are in the more developed nations more uh, concerned about our pollution, our impact on the planet, adopting full renewable energy. We're blessed on this planet with solar energy and wind energy and geothermal energy and water energy and biomass energy. There's no reason to be burning fossil fuels anymore or going down the risky road of atomic or nuclear energy. There are solutions for every aspect of the planet's climate change challenge and about how we work and live together on this planet and how the planet interacts with us. You know, Buckman said this uh, special picture back here. This is my original Earth Day flag from 1970 when we were involved in creating that venture. Uh, it, he said that this is called Spaceship Earth. We really are on a spaceship. It's a blue marble, as they've called it, whirling in space. And it's only 25,000 miles in diameter. And it's all of us, all the four and whatever billion people that are on this planet now and all the other species. And we're all interconnected in an environmental way, in a spiritual way, and also in, in a more important way that we need to be the stewards of the planet. We have that responsibility to do that. Uh, it, it, it's actually in the Bible and in different religions. And I'm glad to see the religious leaders of the world. The Pope uh, has a climate project that we're going to be discussing tonight. And uh, it's very exciting that, that uh, we're coming together on this 52nd uh, anniversary of Earth Day. We, in a way, it's a redo, as you know, of the one that was canceled in 2020. We were gonna do the 50th anniversary. We had plans for hundreds of thousands of people global connections, events around the planet, especially in Los Angeles and Hollywood, we were gonna be the main project to lead that and the pandemic obviously closed us down and we were disappointed. A little makeup for that was that the famous astronaut Ron Guerin did a planetary summit with me for two hours and we're gonna actually broadcast that tonight so people can see what we were doing on April 22nd, 2020 on the 50th birthday of Earth Day. And I'm just thrilled to have our guests, all the people that are surrounding us here. We're hosted by the Ventura Bio Center, which is in Ventura and actually hosts Green to Gold's global headquarters. So I'm just pleased as can be that we're doing the celebration and we're bringing the real true solutions that are available to the planet.
Yeah, we don't need to take any more time just uh, complaining or looking at the problems or the issues and spending our time so quiet, quagmired in the negativity of what doesn't work. I think uh, if anyone who's fairly and, and conscious and aware knows what the problems are. But again, this weekend, we're really trying to, uh, in an accelerated way, to bring these regenerative solutions to the forefront, because even um, in doing that, we still see a lot of the old paradigm. Um, collapsing, the old structures collapsing, collapsing, whether it's uh, environmental, climate change, uh, economic challenges, um, uh, the inability for marginalized communities not to get the type of uh, holistic health care that they need. And, and I just it's want, called environmental justice in many ways now about absolutely. that. Yeah. And, and just uh, since, you know, I have the honor of sitting here next to you for a little bit. Uh, again, you were one of the co-founders of Birthday 52 years ago. And uh, really at the advent of the whole green and sustainability movement. So how does that feel 52 years <laughs> later? I mean, you've done so many incredible projects globally and publications and radio and interviews and green startups. How are you feeling about the, the movement? Uh, you know, the ET, the glowing in ET, that's my heart when I watch everybody being involved in what we're doing. You have to re realize that at the time we did Earth Day, there was no social media. There were no influencers, so to speak. There was no internet. There were no smartphones. All we had were corded phones in houses. And we I had my fax at 100 uh, I think a million faxes on my fax at that time, the most advanced technology that we had. And the funniest thing is that we used the broadcast media, all that's all we had at that time, television and radio. 20 million people showed up, one fifth the US population at that time for the first Earth Day. And it was incredible. It's now become the largest civic event in the world. Several billion people participate, more than 120 countries. We planted a seed that grew to be an incredible oak tree. My interns are mastering in sustainability. I thought about that kind of stuff that, back there. What was remarkable about Earth Day is that even in a Republican administration at that time in 1970 with Richard Nixon, they actually passed the groundbreaking historic environmental protection agency, the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, all these things that have been replicated by almost every country on this planet now and making a, a, a change to protect the environment that sustains us. You would not pollute and dirty your home and poison the water and poison the food in your home. Nobody that's halfway sane would even do that. Yet we're doing it to the biosphere that allows us to survive on this planet along with threatening millions of other species causing extinction of so many kinds of plants and animals. It's a tragedy. And there's a poster hanging on my exhibit, as you know, that's a famous poster that I did for Earth Day and the United Nations Conference on the Human Environment in Stockholm. And it's called The Thinker. Everybody knows the Rodan thinker, you know, right. the sculpture. So what I set about to do was do the thinker in the way I was feeling at that time. And you can see that he's sitting on top of this earth picture. And I sculpture uh, a sculpture that was a skeleton and on his forehead on that skull it says pollution starvation war these were the challenges we were concerned about they have not changed 52 years later humanity is still killing itself its own species war in ukraine we have pollution climate change which is a major problem we have starvation, still 20 million human beings, mostly. Why are you going to make me cry now? Well, I no, was, I was feeling, we're going to, we're going to solve that. Out, okay. <laughs> 20 million uh, people on this planet starve to death every year in a, in a, a, a community and a globe that has all the agricultural resources that we could share and prevent that. It's a breakdown in the way we do the economics, why a green economy will make a big difference and why we're gathering today and tomorrow to show all these solutions. And you you have labeled me a solutionary you came up with the word. And I remember doing an interview with you a couple of years ago in Sacramento about that and it was labeled solutionaries. Well, we're, we're really pushing it now. We want to show people around the world the kinds of people and institutions that are solve the problems that we have so we can live in harmony and balance with each other and the planet.
Well, I wish I could take credit for the word because it, it actually came out of the concept of um, revolutionary because we have to kind of change. We don't live in an age that we need to be fighting against that, that we don't want to give energy to or support. We need to be looking towards evolution. So, so, so revolutionary became evolutionary, which still sounds, okay, what is evolution? Uh, and in such a divided world, so almost 8 billion different perspectives and perceptions of reality. So we said solutionary, and that's kind of the word we settle on because everyone can understand that, yeah, we need to find solutions to these huge issues that are affecting us all globally. And that every no more marginalized community, marginalized people, uh, gender, ages, that we all have to get involved in this opportunity to make positive change because the ability to do that is going to be not only our ability to sustain to a regenerative culture, we go into actually not just surviving, but we actually start thriving again as uh, claiming our divine birthright as human beings. We're one species. It's ridiculous. To I remember if, if I still have a minute, I will tell you that when I was a youngster, there was a famous book about King Arthur and the round table, the legend, and it was called The Once and Future King. And Merlin, the magician, the mystic, actually took young King Arthur him to a fish so that he could learn how fish and other creatures live and he watched the big fish eating the smaller fish and the smaller fish eating those smaller fish but the most important lesson is that he made uh, Arthur it is do you see any of those borders here or any of those maps on that planet earth that's our home spaceship earth for all of us and we have to pull together and in this new push that we're doing and solutionaries push i think we're going to make a big difference if the in the listen greta went around a couple of years ago now and bless her cotton pig and heart she went around the world and raised the attention youngsters and everyone else she challenged the leaders of the world at the un you're just talking and talking do something and so i think it's time the theme this year is take action as it was action we great idea either for a nonprofit with impact or inventing inventing technology please get to us we want to help you we want to push you forward and have success and help that green economy be successful for all the planet and that might even include maybe starting a uh area and i know uh we have some people who are talking about their work uh, in the community, doing amazing work. And I had the privilege to walk a property last week where there's a very powerful solution uh, potential. Everyone that's going to be here, part of this event and this broadcast uh, over this weekend, uh, we're not just talking about things, but they're actually doing things. And the idea with the broadcast, reaching out to people around the world, is for you to find something if you're not already heavily engaged in doing something, find something you're passionate about. Contact these people. Uh, Alan, again, he has a green incubator. He's worked with hundreds of organizations. The impact, you know, they say that, you know, sometimes people feel a little apathetic or, or depressed. So I'm just one person. What can I do? But then we look at people like Gandhi. We look at people like Mother Teresa. We look at people like Martin Luther, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. I mean, we look at people like John Lennon's. We look at uh, traditional uh, spiritual teachers around the world. And actually, there's a lot one person can do. But as you're saying, we live in this time of we have to join hands. We have to get over this uh, horrific divisiveness that's been so prevalent, not just for um, uh, hundreds of years and centuries, but we have to come a whole new way 
of, of being. And this is why, you know, we talked about sustainability. We talked about regeneration. So uh, for 52 years of your sustainability mm -hmm. work and Earth Day and the incredible amount of work that you and people around the world have taken under the brand of Earth Day um, that really belongs to the world, we still have a collapsing system in so many ways. So sustainability and resilience partnering with regeneration and I do want to say when we say regeneration, people tend to go right towards environmentalism, but a uh, full spectrum regenerative culture is really about um, everything. So, so picture at the center of a, a wheel, we have regenerative culture and all the spokes go out. We have uh, the role of arts and culture. Absolutely. Not only do a lot of people globally make their living there, but it enhances our quality of life. And it gives us a window to another person's soul to see something and experience something that we can't always put in words. Uh, I have a, a whole spiritual regenerative culture where we're learning from our ancestors. We're learning from the different spiritual traditions, the religious traditions. And, and we actually are uh, first and foremost, including indigenous communities in the discourse who have been keeping this traditional ecological knowledge and relationship to the to Mother Earth for thousands of years intact, and only through the most recent, uh, more patriarchal colonial mindset has things begun to acceleratedly deteriorate. But, but when we talk about, about the environment and ecology, we talk about holistic health and wellness uh, and personal responsibility for our own wellness. Uh, we also are looking at things like green energy, regenerative economics, alternative economics, going back to bartering, trading is the whole movement of, uh, of cryptocurrency and non-centralized finances. Uh, and we're also looking heavily, and I, and I wanna say in our next um, guest, we're looking greatly at the, the balancing of uh, the important role that women have the uh, our mothers our grandmothers our sisters our daughters have in this whole regenerative culture because so much of that voice has been um suppressed, suppressed, and, suppressed. and oppressed yeah so it's an exciting time and uh here as we kind of uh you know, share the mantle. It's always an honor, and and your advisorship and mentorship, your your green knighthood, your 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 wizardry, <laughs> your professorness uh, is always uh, inspiration, and it's really been instrumental for um, the Earth Stock Foundation to kind of move to the next level. So uh, we'll get more into talking about that, um, but right now we have a few minutes left, and then I'm going to invite in, uh, in one of our uh, local um, uh, friends and and. Uh, spiritual advisors from the indigenous community here in Southern California to share some words and kind of to open up uh, our sacred space here today. But before we get there, is there any other uh, things you'd like to share uh, as we kind of launch uh, our two-day broadcast? Yeah, I would like to point out that everybody can make a change. That's what you were just talking about. If just as consumers, what you, how you spend the money that buys your food, buys your utilities, uh, pays your rent, buys your house, builds your house, Everything that you do as consumers, going to the movie, if you can take a time to just research about the impact of those particular areas that you're spending money on and change it so that you, when you buy that product, you need that sustenance, uh, buy something that's helping the planet. It's a company that's trying to make a difference. It's a nonprofit trying to make a difference. Support them. We have, as you know, we're launching today a new Earth coin incredible and i hope everybody will go and discover what it is because we're trying to fund all these great nonprofits and inventors and entrepreneurs and regenerative people through a new type of uh, on the wax system which is the greenest of all the platforms uh, for bitcoin the earth coin is magnificent and there's a if you can go to yoshidrops.com that's y-o-s-h-i drops.com you're going to hear something that's quite magnificent that affected me back in, in 1964, I believe it was, when I was marching with Martin Luther King and doing anti-Vietnam War and anti-nuclear weapons and everything else that were so idealistic that caused us to do Earth Day. And that was a quote by Adlai Stevenson about what Buckminster call, Fuller called Spaceship Earth. And I would like everybody to get a chance to listen to me reciting that quote. It's, it's the most profound 
thing you could probably listen to that was done so long ago about our plight on this planet and what we needed to help each other survive. So I hope you'll take the opportunity as a consumer to make your purchases smart and then also to look into the earth coin and support that so we can support all these solutionaries. Enough for me right now, huh? Well, ne never <laughs> but I'm going to be here for a little bit longer, like a few more years, I hope, at least making a difference here Absolutely. and helping other people make a difference. And also, I mean, you're really instrumental in uh, helping us be here at this facility that we've been using. I mean, we looked at doing the event uh, in Los Angeles at other locations, and sometimes it was like, well, hey, we want to do this gap gathering for Earth Day, it's like, well, you can use the facility for $5,000, or you can use this for $10,000, <laughs> or you can do this, or you can do that, or you can only have 50 people. And I mean, there were so many limitations. So the fact that we're able to partner with you, and I just want to acknowledge before we have up um, Sewa from uh, One Drum, who's going to kind of do our opening, um, let's acknowledge some of our sponsors. I know that a lot of them were very instrumental in helping to feed our VIPs Absolutely. tonight and the space. Thank you. That's, uh, of course, uh, Greg, a Gauchin who created this Ventura Biocenter that hosts Green to Gold's uh, world headquarters. We're hoping and pleased as, as you can imagine to have this happen here at this uh, location. And he did that. We have Good Goods, which is a whole new platform for tackle product that is a sponsor. We also have uh, Title Three Funds which is a new paradigm from the Obama Jobs Act about equity crowdfunding where anyone in the world, no longer just the rich people and the people that are on Wall Street, anyone in the world can invest in these ventures that we're talking about and make a difference, support the companies that are making that difference and pr producing new products and creating new uh, concepts for us and new energy and new transportation. And we also want to thank um, the people that are at Organic by Nature, that cares about nutrition and well-being and organic foods. And, and in fact, we're gonna actually be interviewing him right. uh, tomorrow. The founder will have a new um, nonprofit again. We've done 200 of them that are impactful, socially, environmentally responsible. And he has something called the new Plastic Free uh, Packaging Alliance. And that is, be the industry driving itself to get rid of plastic fossil fuel based uh, packaging and make it more bio based, more sustainable. So we have some wonderful people that are helping us on this project. Fantastic. And of course, uh, there's so many other things happening. I know we were, you did uh, some support with media with One World. We also had America's Next Investment, which we're looking at potentially doing some more media. I mean, there's so much stuff happening. And I will say as an event producer, it's very bizarre to do an event where I'm not outside with thousands of people. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but the challenge is right now, as we know, part of the messaging right now, instead of just doing more festivals, more celebrations, more events, more parties, more, 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 sometimes less is more. So part of this whole weekend, and I think it's going to become obvious when you see our presenters, is we're trying to get the solutionaries the lions and the lionesses, uh, all the doers actually to the table to help enhance the connectivity, specifically here in Southern California, but really uh, we have presenters from all around the world. Yeah. So an amazing it, opportunity. It's come together and it's the right time. We all realize it. That, you know, there's one last comment. I was on um, green.org is one of our sponsors, Dylan Welch created it and he did a world summit and uh, it's an annual green summit. And he had me on both last year and this year. Just before me was a marine biologist. And that lady said something that was quite profound, that there is a finite pool for worry for all of us. And when you think about all the things that we're worrying about now on the planet right now, the climate change, the horrible war in Ukraine, uh, the supply chain mess, the inflation, uh, everything that the pollution that's continuing to happen, that's, we've been tapped out on worry. And what I'm hoping to do and see happen here is that we're all positive and we're optimistic about real true solutions, regenerative, sustainable, resilient solutions. That's what we want to bring during these next two days. And we want you to join with us, be part of this movement to make a better planet for all of us. 
Well, words of wisdom. I don't think I could even say anything after that. So, Alan, I see uh, Greg from uh, Ventura Bio Centers here. Maybe in a little bit, we'll have him up um, if he's going to be available in like 10 minutes. And tomorrow, we're going to talk to Greg about his initiative on green chemistry and how exciting that is. And we're proud of Green to Gold to actually work with them on that. Absolutely. Because, yeah, we have to uh, kind of penetrate into the... Um, uh, the manufacturers, the companies, the big players. And the academia, where they're doing research and, and give them different tools in green chemistry. It'll Absolutely. make a big difference. Absolutely. So let's do this. I want to thank you for, for um, coming up. I see Rachel Linden's getting on the call here in a moment, and uh, I'm going to have her, but we're going to do a, a brief opening ceremony. She's a little bit early, a professional, on point <laughs> as she is, and she's another voice of the divine feminine who is doing international work around organic land care and changing uh, practices of people who are basically just every day adding more poison to our landscaping, to our homes, to our lives, to our children, to our schools, to our parks. So uh, in just a minute, we're going to have Rachel up. But uh, Thank you, Alan. We'll have Again, you back. Yeah, I'm here for the two days. All right. beyond. Thank you. Mike. Thank you. So I want to invite before we have Rachel speak, I'm going to invite up uh, Siwa from the One Drum Group. And uh, she is one of our uh, local uh, elders and is really uh, going to help us kind of to bring into uh, um, our sacred awareness about the importance of this time and bringing us all to another level of connection and coherence. So I will say we'll turn the camera. We have a room filling up with people here, but we're just the ones here uh, doing the broadcast. So again, thank you so much. Well, thank you, Michael, for having us, our One Drum Sisters here today. And for not even allowing i'm going to change that if i may thank you for remembering the indigenous voice and asking us to be a part of because we are here as people and we have much to share and much to bring forth and i thank you for that thank you it's important it's really important a lot of our elders you know say that you know they feel forgotten And so as I sit here, I carry them with me. And I thank you for all the work that you do in the world and what you provide. And as, as one drum, you know, we have an amazing, incredible sisterhood of women in our tribal that gather around the drum for the sole purpose of healing ourselves and our community. They it is needed and it is time for us women also to come together in that way to sing our prayers so that we can have equality of men and women and that we can remember that we have a voice and it is our time in the most loving gracious way to bring it forward and thank you for including and i and i reach out to everybody to include and remember the indigenous community and i thank the people of this land the shumash and yes you know we have other tribes that navigate it this way too, but I want to be very respectful and mindful of whose land that we are graciously spending some time on. And I thank you for that. And so I don't know what else you would like. Well, of me. well thank you for the land acknowledgement, uh, because, you know, as a producer, whenever we do events, we always like to honor the people who have stewarded uh, and protected and worked with the land of where we are. So thank you for I that. Hope, I hope. And uh, I know that you and your group will be doing a, an official opening a little bit later yes. with the with the drum. And we have this amazing altar, which we're going to share with you. Um, but I don't know, do you feel, I know you're a carrier of songs. Well, I have, and if it would be possible, if I can have my sisters stand with me if that would be possible here we could just hear our voices absolutely and um that's you know it's, it's unusual for me to you know be here alone because we are a group of women and i have a co-founder ginger grant which come over here miss ginger get one next to you and so it's, it's very unusual that you'll see me by myself because it is one drum that's universal that's all of us that universal heart Heartbeat, that is you, that is me, that is us. You know, in our traditions, our elders tell her there's no I, there's we, us, our. And so that's what one drum is. 
that's exactly what we are. We are a group of indigenous women that gather around the drum to sing our prayers for the sole purpose of healing our hearts and ourself and our community. So if you would give us a moment, we would allow and we would love, 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 love to just regroup and sing a beautiful prayer for you to open this up in this space in that way. If that feels right, Michael, do you have time Absol for that? Absolutely. Oh. Sisters, what are we feeling today? And I would love if if we could have uh, our sister Vivi read the prayer that Chief Orville Looking Horse sent in today. Yeah, would that, that would be, be possible? What would you want? Absolutely. Would, how about she reads the prayer? We'll regroup and see what we want to sing. Okay. And then we'll come together. Thank you for being in the flow, remembering that water. That we're just fluid. And I thank you for being patient uh, with us as we navigate and figure this out, as Michael was saying so beautifully. We're so used to being out in public for one of these events with a lot of people and you're looking, you're moving, and this is just a different way that we have to adjust. But we also have really take smoke for all of you. And we're holding that space. You know, we don't, I was taught that we don't speak until we have our medicine burning and flowing because when the sages bring the medicine and the copal and the sweet grass and the cedar and the tobacco, we must speak truth. Luturia et the hook, truth has been spoken. So I'm gonna have Sister Vivi read this for you and we're gonna to come together as sisters and ask creator what he would like us to bring forth for you. Okay, what do you guys want? The message is June 21st, 2022. We warned that one day you would not be able to control what you have created. That day is here. Now we must unite once again to create an energy shift upon Grandmother Earth. She cannot take any more impact from all the selfish decisions being made. We have come to that place in this time upon Earth to now make a stand together, to unite each in our own sacred life, ways we have chosen to walk, whatever religion or belief, go to your sacred spaces and join us in these special prayers for the earth on June 21st. It has been proven we can create miracles when we unite spiritually. Many white animals have shown their sacred color throughout the world now, and they continue to communicate that we are at the crossroads. We have walked through two years of losing many relatives through a terrible disease, and so have the animals and plant life also continue to suffer. The imbalance of Minibuchoni, water of life, causing droughts and fires to severe flooding is everywhere. And I feel more suffering is to come from all these poor choices that are being made. I humbly request a time from each of the two-legged in this world to send a prayer to our precious earth and the balance of Mini, of Mini Buchoni to be restored. Begin to prepare in your homelands to unite all nations, all faiths, one prayer. For the sake of Grandmother Earth, our source of life, not a resource. In a sacred hoop of life where there is no ending and no beginning, Chief Arvel Looking Horse, the 19th keeper of the sacred white buffalo calf pipe. Oh. Oh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sisters, mm -hmm. you ready? Yeah, touch sister. Yeah, touch sister. Water all peoples. Mother, ask. We were asked to walk gently upon her and do no harm. So we pray that you remember to remember the humility that she carries for each and every one of us. That we show up and we walk in that way. And that we see each other when we do the work. All those that we meet on our journey and on our path.
Okay, so uh, Rachel Linden, you there? I sure am. Hey, Michael, how are you? Looks like you're muted, my friend. Uh, can you hear me? I can. I can definitely hear you now. Yeah. Great. So, I introduce you and uh, talk tech stuff here. But I want to introduce you. Uh, thank you for being our amazing um, sponsor and associate producer of the uh, Earth Day Green Film Fest. Uh, for those of you watching, I want to welcome Rachel Linden from Green Lifestyles Network, and uh, she's also one of the key uh, people in uh, non-toxic communities, and uh, she does amazing work. So with that, I'm going to introduce you, and uh, if you could tell us a little bit about you and your work, and uh, and hopefully we're going to inspire some people to get to roll up their sleeves, sleeves and get involved. So Hi, Michael. Um, so great to join all of you. Um, I'm sorry I missed the singers, uh, but I'm on the East Coast. And so I'm not live with the event, but um, I'm glad that you've given me an opportunity to take a few minutes to discuss some things that probably most people don't even know about, which would be organic land care. And you think, well, we've probably heard of organic farming, but organic land care, I'm sure, isn't something that the average person's heard of. And we're hoping at non-toxic communities to turn that around because it's um, it's important for, for our common spaces that we take into consideration uh, nature and health, for sure. So you've heard of organic farming, and that has principles and rules applied to it, but um, organic land care is, is similar in a way, but you're not growing crops, you're growing the other, uh, cr the other large crop, which is um, not food crops, is turf. Turf gra grass actually happens to be the number one crop grown in the United States. Um, clearly not for food, but more for ornamental and for play. But it's, it's a common place where you'll find a myriad of chemicals pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, biocides, um, and synthetic fertilizers. And all of those things contribute to the chemical soup that we, we're all having to live in and they are compounding. And most people are completely unaware of how toxic they are. In fact, when I, when I talk to a municipality or an advocate, um, usually an advocate, a local, a local champion, will know that there's toxic chemicals at play in their public spaces and they wanna do something about it. And um, those brave souls um, generally will, will have a, a basic idea of, of how their town is run um, and their municipal park programs. And what we do is we, we help them understand the uh, principles of organic land care. It's really not complicated, but it puts everybody on the same page. So when we all know what what has to be done to maintain a, a park naturally. Um, we are all on the same page. We know we know how to proceed, right? Because not everybody knows how, especially really these park uh, park maintenance people and 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 um, even your local mayor may have no idea how toxic the products that they're using in your town really are. And um, one of the first things that you do as an advocate is you pull a public records request and find out what what is being used in your parks and your playgrounds and oftentimes when you when you take those records and you you ask you have them in your hand and you ask your representatives in in your city hey are we using anything toxic in our town nine times out of ten when i talk to municipality michael they will say to me we would never use anything toxic of course not and then you confront them with the reality of what's happening all across America. And sometimes they're shocked and sometimes they're a little apathetic to be frank. Um, and then you remind them that they're there to represent the people and that safety is, must be a priority in our communities. So at non-toxic communities, we, we, help, uh, we help empower local advocates. And you can reach us at nontoxiccommunities.com and you'll find that our website has a lot of really um, practical advice and some really sage, um, sage, sage tools that you can use to get the ball rolling in your town. 
and it's sweeping across the country. I'll be frank with you. Um, many of these cities are have these climate initiatives that they're working on to mitigate uh, carbon, right? And sequester carbon and, and mitigate climate change uh, problems. And so an organic park program or pilot program is exactly um, in the right direction for sequestering carbon and, um, and putting a smaller carbon footprint in your town for sure. It's a legacy too. Um, sometimes well, I, will, mm -hmm. I will say it's amazing. The talk to you one week you're in New Jersey, the next week you're in Hawaii, then you're up in the Hudson River Valley of upstate New York. So, like you're saying, this is a, this organic uh, land care, and like you said, it's not just agriculture. It's how people do landscaping and maintain do maintenance on their yard is really having a horrendous effect. So. Um, what are some, I know there's different ways that people do this, but what's the mechanism that you find success in getting traction to help people make that transition from toxic to non-toxic? Well, I like um, the organic land care standards. So it's just a 62 page document. Um, it was written by landscapers for landscapers and can be used in any environment, um, whether you're on a tropical island or you're in a city park in New York City, um, the principles will still apply. It's uh, preferred, allowed, and prohibited practices, and preferred, allowed, and prohibited products. Like, for instance, synthetic turf is prohibited in organic land care. So are synthetic um, fertilizers and pesticides of all kinds. And there are a lot of toxic inputs well beyond just, just weed killer in a park. And all of that um, comes into play when we talk about the microbiome of the soil, which the food soil web, the soil web is, is the living planet that we are on and the soil is alive. But when you spray it with toxic inputs like fertilizers, synthetic fertilizers or weed killer, you kill off that biome. And in so doing, um, the nutrition that you add to the soil, uh, whether that is uh, nitrogen or whatever, isn't going to be able to be metabolized within the soil and turned into healthy plants. What happens is it just washes off. And you see that ending up in our, our watersheds, um, polluting uh, public spaces and polluting drinking water, creating algae blooms and contributing to climate change in a very direct and profound way. No. You're saying too, a lot of that gets into our, our metabolizes and stops us from uh, uptaking our different nutrients and minerals. And as we've come to realize that the whole center of human health is really our microbiome and how our gut communicates with our physiology and, and, and things like for say Roundup and, and some of these other things, including what you're talking about. Uh, people don't realize they have devastating effects. There seems to be a disconnect between the natural world and our environment and the relationship to, our, to human health. Yeah, you know, I often lead with, if I've got a skeptic in a city, um, I lead with the $11 billion, now I believe $12 billion class action lawsuit against one ingredient in one product. Well, I shouldn't say that. It's in quite a few products, but everybody's familiar with Monsanto or now Bayer's Roundup and glyphosate. It's not the only chemical. I mean, we have over 60,000 chemicals out there, many of which are toxic on their own, much less when you synergize them by combining them with other chemicals to create um, unknown and dangerous substances that we haven't even begun to understand the damage that we have contributed to as a society. And you start to look at it like, why, why are we doing this? Because the one thing that I don't often get to say, which is like my pride and joy, is that when a town does go organic or a campus or a playing field or park, the most beautiful thing happens. The birds come back, the bees, the butterflies. It's lush. The plants know that the plants are now getting their oh, Pollinators. Pollinators, of course. Right, and, which is the, yeah, pollinators, which actually give us our food security. Totally. The I flowers mean, flowers that give us our orchards and all the other things. So, 
Yeah, we don't want to we don't want to poison them. And there's a big movement right now to put pollinator gardens in 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 public spaces. And I I think that's fantastic. Rainwater gardens, pollinator gardens. The problem with it is if you're not going to change the environment, why would you invite beautiful creatures to to an environment that's not optimal? a suboptimal environment for pollinators and suboptimal environment for ourselves and our children, for sure. Uh, it, and we, we took some time to, to recently speak with the city of San Diego and people don't know this, but many cities actually um, would like to implement these programs, but they just don't know how. And taking the time to understand um, that there, there is a way to do it in transition. And I say transition, it's a quick transition um, to get off of synthetics and to move towards natural practices, which just enhance the environment and, and really benefit everyone involved, um, including the staff themselves, you know, who, put, who do a lot of hard work to make sure that our public spaces are beautiful. Um, and, and they sometimes don't even know they're in harm's way. Uh, the class action lawsuit in California with Bayer uh, the, the bellwether client, uh, Lee Johnson, he, he was a groundskeeper for Benicia school district for only two years before he developed non-Hodgkin's lymphoma or the beginnings of what would be non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And that's a sad testimony. He's a young guy with, with little kids and his prognosis is not fantastic. Nobody wants to hear that they've got non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and, and, Honestly, we, we don't, how many people were before him that will never benefit from the class action, you know, and how many people will be after him before we decide that our, our frontline park, park providers and maintenance people, that they're important and their health is important to our community as well. So, so th those are, that's organic land care and that's nontoxiccommunities.com. And I hope people will decide to take this on in their own community. It's very satisfying. I won't say it's fast work, but uh, San Diego, we, it, we've been meeting with them, Golden, Colorado, uh, Princeton, New Jersey, uh, Dover, uh, Dover, New Hampshire just went fully organic, Irvine, California, organic. And it's, it's beautiful to want to be a part of that. Over 200 cities across the country. Some of them I have nothing to do with. <laughs> they have, a, it's a good idea that's catching on. Um, but it's always nice to know that you've got, and nobody does this alone. Like I'm going to do a shout out to all the nonprofits that we work with at non-toxic communities. Beyond pesticides, um, they're yeah, huge. Yeah, please do. Who are some of the other um, oftentimes there's local players um, that we team up with, and those are usually native plant people, um, watershed folks, um, sometimes they're gardening uh, clubs, sometimes they're HOAs or PTAs that we team up with, and, um, you know, Silent Springs, we, you know, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring Institute, we we work with them, Xerces Society, shout out to them, Environmental Working Group, also another great organization, um, PAN, Pesticide Action Network, because it really takes a village to pull off something this good. And it, it's a super rewarding thing to have these meetings. I mean, sometimes it's even, we're bringing in experts who are what's called an AOLCP, which is an accredited organic land care professional. And that's a class you can take online through NOFA Connecticut. And that class is, um, gives you the basics of organic land care. It's part-time over a month done online. It's only a few hundred dollars. We actually offer a discount at nontoxiccommunities.com and sometimes even help with scholarships for municipal workers to get a program going. Um, but it's very rewarding and it's beautiful to see when it's done right the grass is really green. I mean, professional ball fields are even now asking to be maintained organically. Fisher Cat Stadium is organic. The campus at Harvard University is organic. And the list goes on and on. There's so many, like I said, there's over all courses. Teams. I've been he hearing about, I've been golf hearing about courses. Yeah, I've yeah. been hearing about golf courses. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Not everywhere, but, and when it's done, it, it looks beautiful. It's lush. 
and you can feel the difference when you walk in. And look, it's a legacy that we're going to give our children, you know, cumulative effects of toxic inputs in soil makes everything toxic, the air, the water, the dust, the residue, the plants. You know, one other thing that's not often talked about is neonicotinoids, which some people have heard, oh, they're impacting pollinators, but they are um, systemic pesticides put into nursery stock, right? Um, and the plants are toxic. And sometimes that's like five and 10 years they're toxic from their leaves to their roots. So neonicotinoids are not used in organic land care. So rather than trying to ban one chemical or one product or all the products or just pesticides or just herbicides, you can, you can get rid of all of it by advocating for a higher standard, which then gives you a solution-based argument to, to go to your representatives with. And that is so timely right now to have good solutions that are tried and true and that are working in other places. That's what, that's what community needs right now are those solutions. So we're, we're always happy to talk to, to whoever out there that might be interested in doing it. Go to nontoxiccommunities.com and fill out a request for our toolkit. That gives us a little bit of your information and then we send you information on how to get started. And we've got a film festival coming up, Michael. Do we have time to talk about that? Yeah. Yeah, we do. In just a moment, because uh, we, we have an opportunity, actually, the person who's hosting the space here in Ventura was just uh, here. So I wanted to introduce uh, Greg Kushan. Hi. Uh, and he's with the Ventura Buyer Center. Is the facility where uh, Alan, uh, Professor Alan Tratner and Green the Gold is based. So I just want to take a moment to acknowledge him, find out about his work and thank him. And then we're going to get into the film festival a little bit. And then we have Elizabeth Harold, which stand with Amazonia and so uh, who are going to be sharing some of the work that they're doing around the, the just the sad uh, deforestation of the Amazon, not only that, but the loss of indigenous land rights. But before we do all that, we have an action packed uh, two days here. I want to introduce Greg from the. So welcome. Hello, thank you. Nice to be here. Great. It's great to have you here. So on a uh, day to day basis, what are some of the things that you do here in the, uh, the bio center? Well, um, I'm going to say I wash uh, dishes and I wash floors. And <laughs> Um, no, we have, um, so we are a, 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 a incubator facility for technical startups. So companies that are people that have an idea for a new, a new medical device or a life-saving technology, uh, it can be hard to get started, you know, when you're first starting out and you don't have a hundred million in the bank account. So we provide laboratory space and facilities and, and, and equipment for those companies uh, just to give them a boost and, and give them a chance at uh, being successful. So they usually stay here for a while and, and develop that and they hire people and, and try to get more funding. Usually they get to a point if they're successful where they have a, a good prototype, they, they make that drug and they show that it does what it's supposed to do or they build their device and they show that it works and then they get a big lot of funding for the next stage and they move out. So for us, success is when they leave uh, under the right circumstances. So uh, we like it. We've had a number of companies graduate um, and go on to bigger things. Typically they'll get a round of funding, they'll hire a bunch more people, they'll buy more lab equipment and move into a much larger facility. Fantastic. So we've well, it's been really, here about nine years, yeah. Well, it's really inspiring to find people working at your level because, I mean, there's things we can do like talking with Rachel uh, and about organic land care and about environmental toxins. So there's yeah. things, and this is what I kind of pontificate a lot about, everybody can do whether it's the, uh, the body care products that we use, maybe using ones that aren't toxic, they don't have aluminum, they don't have other things on it, and mm -hmm. how that has a negative impact, not only on our own health, but on the watershed. Yep. And then there's our household cleaning products, the things we use in our homes. I go into some people's places and the products they're using, it, it really blows my mind because there's such a high level of toxicity, yep. not only to the children and to the family, in the watershed and then we look like what rachel's talking about how do we do our land care how do we do our landscaping how do we maintain a healthy environment and then we can go from our personal responsibility to larger maybe being an advocate around uh non-toxic communities or or an act 
like, um, you know, people who can go around and actually educate and empower others with the solutions. But I, I want to say, besides the personal uh, part that people can do, the fact that you're helping to incubate and work with large companies, manufacturers, people that are huge, having uh, massive effects on large amounts of the population is really inspiring. So it's nice that you were able to open your doors and, and host yeah. us and host the event and, and also to acknowledge the work that you're doing. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Al and I are going to have a, a fuller discussion tomorrow on green some of the things are going on, but I just, I can say, you know, there's sort of two phases to attacking this problem. One is where we get all these chemicals that we use in everyday life. And traditionally they've come from oil, uh, but now we need to get them from somewhere else and that effort is well underway. The other one is the toxicity that you mentioned. Even if we get things from plant-based sources, if they're toxic, they're still toxic. So how do we deal with that? And I think both of those are, are being addressed in a lot of research, a lot of uh, university. So there's great hope. And I, my message for everybody is for people considering career choices, you know, chemistry isn't necessarily a field where you're going to be inventing dangerous chemicals to hurt things. You can help fix this problem in chem. Well, it's really interesting. I had a conversation the other day with Jim DuPont from the mm -hmm. DuPont family, and they're mm -hmm. actually looking at a whole uh, new generation of non-toxic polymers and mm -hmm. different things. So wow. it's nice to know. I mean, we have to hit it from the personal to the industrial to the manufacturing and and really every side of this so. yeah exactly right right so this well, will help get the word out Very absolutely good. And, and you have a website if people want to check out more we about do your work. yeah it's uh, ventura biocenter.com great so you can take a look and see what the place is about great well thank you so much for yeah, opening the space and taking some time sure, for your you busy welcome. day and it's fun. we'll have a much more to come over the next day and a half so great. thank you thank you great so uh, I want to go back to Rachel Linden and uh, you took a lot of time and dedication to be an associate producer and help put together uh, an amazing film festival. And I think we're going to see a little clip of one of those. Um, again, these are not lengthy, you know, multiple hour films. You have a lot of shorts and some trailers. And I think we had talked about we're going to be showing uh, one basically about the soil. I was going to say the soul solution, but Freudian slip the soil solution to climate change. Can you tell us a little bit uh, about that and what inspired you to pick that film? Oh, okay, okay. So we're gonna have, you're gonna see a wide genre of environmental films. And I tried to stay positive. So uh, just know that, that I tried to stay inspiring and positive because there's a lot of things that can, can trip you up. And I, I really wanted to stay in the celebration of our earth, right? And, and solution-based, right? So we have um, we have many movies actually on, on soil, different varieties of soil content. Um, some of it is revolving around um, regenerative agriculture. Some is permaculture. We have shorts on compost, how to do it right, how to do it in your yard. Um, we have some on wild foraging, you know, one, one incredible way to keep your carbon, your personal carbon footprint low is to, to forage where you live, right? Um, carbon sequestration in the soil. Uh, we have, we have permaculture happening in urban settings and in rural settings and in suburban settings, because you can do it anywhere. You can do it with a bucket. If you do, if you only have a little bit of sunlight and a bucket, you can figure it out. It's not it's not impossible. So we wanted to to pick one really great film, and we we took one. Um, and and believe me, you have to kiss a lot of frogs to get to get the best of the internet um, because there's a lot of content out there on YouTube. I challenge anybody to take to take you know about six months and watch watch the bulk of what's out there on climate change and on um, remediation and and there's just there's just a lot. And I wanted to pepper it with inspiration as well from some of our forefathers of thought. Um, and, and so you'll see there are going to be clips of it from Buckminster Fuller and from Nikola Tesla, who's my, mwah, he's one of my favorites, right? Um, he's the OG of sustainability and free energy and um, such a pioneer. Um, not everybody, and it won't go into detail on this, but not everybody even knows this, but he developed supplements and health devices 
the guy just was a renaissance man so um i had to do a shout out for him and of course there's there's some documentaries on um on farming if you wanted to change your vocation and turn into a a gentlewoman or a gentleman farmer uh, or anything in between uh, and decide to go out and venture into the wild world of providing uh, food or products for, for consumers and, and what does that take and what does that entail? Um, and I just wanna put a shout out too. We did a little bit of a touch on finances and what things are changing in the world and, and where where is our leadership coming from? Who do we turn to? Who do we think of when we think of, um, you know, game changers in the world right now? So I wanted to introduce some people um, to the conversation that that maybe not everybody knows about, right? Um, you might have heard of the comedian Russell Brand. Uh, he has a fantastic YouTube channel. I just picked one of his most recent uh, posts because He's just, he's got it going on right now. And it, and he really keeps it lively and sassy. Damn it, and, yeah. Yeah, totally. And I, by the way, tell him I want my shirts back. Russell, I want my shirts back. <laughs> um, but yeah, he's a good guy. He's got a good sense of humor and I like to keep it light when I can. Um, we have a few new players to the scene. Um, Kiss the Ground has the full story on compost. And believe me, the full story is only is less than seven minutes long. So we're keeping it short these days. Uh, I wanted to introduce a few other people too. Um, Sorella Moore for finance. She goes into uh, sort of where we're going with crypto and who's trying to, there's a power play with our finances going on. She does a succinct um, conversation about it that really isn't to be missed. And so I wanted to, to introduce the our group to, to her. Um, some of the great players in, in edible um, foraging, uh, Rob Greenfield, if you're not familiar with him, he's fantastic. Uh, we've got a few sponsored products out there right now. Um, shout out to Natural Grocers, who's kicking booty. Um, they've wow. been sponsoring a lot of really great content out there and events. I was just at the Environmental Health Symposium for Physicians in Tucson, and they were a sponsor of that event as well talking about, uh, you know, all the environmental toxins and um, body burden, and they, they sponsored a solution-based uh, symposium on that. So shout out to Natural Grocers. Happen Films. Happen Films is like cool. Uh, they made, our, they made our, key, our key anchor movie, which is Living the Change, but they've got another one coming up, um, Together We Grow, which is also good. Happen Films is... It are two people, uh, Jordan Osmond and Antoinette Wilson, and they're from New Zealand and they are young and they are rocking it. They, they're showcasing some of the best ideas and the best success stories in um, New Zealand and Australia and a few in the US. They, they really are inspiring and super cool. And maybe one of these days we'll actually get to interview them, which would be great. Um, so there's a lot of um, new players in the regenerative farming arena. It's like, finally, we're kind of getting like, okay, we don't have to have, we don't have to have farming over here and animal husbandry over here. We can combine the two. And it turns out when you do that, you get, you get much more than just the parts together. You get you get a synergy that is fantastic. Well, you get a better it's, agricultural it's, it's, product and a healthier soil and yeah. a healthier animal. And it's interesting that you're saying that because a big part of full spectrum regenerative design is we can't just look at the environment and the ecology outside of ourselves anymore. We also have to look at our, our personal resilience, our emotional resilience, our own health and wellness. We have to look at things like green energy. Uh, we have to look at regenerative economies. We all have to look at things that uh, about our arts and culture help uh, build a better quality of life it can be a big economic driver so i love what you've done with the film festival because you've really went into all these full uh, areas of regenerative culture so i do want to say this we're going to go over to the um we're going to look at the uh, uh the soil film of, uh, in regards to uh climate change but i do want to acknowledge right now we are broadcasting also on the unify network uh, i want to thank Mar miranda clandering and also 
the tech part. And I just want to thank them. And we're going to do an official uh, sign off with them here in a few minutes. They're on to other uh, broadcast parts of the hundreds of events happening today for Earth Day. But I do want to thank Unify Network for their support. And after the this mini film, we have um, Elizabeth Harold and Sol Abrazo, who's going to get on uh, the broadcast again, talking about Stand with Amazonia and what's happening down in uh, in Brazil around in and other things. So uh, if you have another quick word of wisdom, I think we'll go over to the film and uh, we're doing good. We're staying on schedule. So again, uh, if you just joined us, I'm talking with Rachel Linden, uh, vice president, correct, from non-toxic communities and also from uh, Green Lifestyles Network. Uh, you're my hero. You are a rock star, uh, madam, because the amount of stuff you're doing and traveling and and being a mom and, 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 and wife and activist and advocate and educator is just really um, amazing. And so I'm moving. For... Oh, you're mo okay. I'm moving. <laughs> yeah. I'm in the process of buying a farm. It's like, it's just crazy mayhem, Incredible. right? Incredible. But um, yeah, I do have just a couple, couple few little things real quick, and then I'll let you transition. Um, how to quit your job and start farming featuring Joel Salatin. And Joel Salatin gives away blueprints to everything. He has a book on it, but he also offers all that online. If it's at all something you're thinking about, check out Joel Salatin. The next thing is we may round out, and I'm kind of hoping we do, with um, a 52 minute movie on the rights of nature. So your folks wow. in the Amazon, a shout out to them, folks in Brazil, Ecuador, this is your, this is your uh, film. This is the thing that could, could keep everything together. It's nature has rights and in court and nature gets to win, you know? Wow. Uh, so that's exciting. And I just want to say a big thank you to you, Michael, for all your hard work for Golden Road Productions and for my board at Green Lifestyles Network that helps make all of this happen. A big thank you and happy, happy Earth Day. Happy Earth Day. Uh, again, Rachel Linden, thank you so much. We're going to go over to the film now. And uh, yeah, I've been looking forward to it. I think I started to dip my toes in the water here and watch it, but I ran out of time and had to go back to production. So I'm looking forward to enjoying this along with our audience. And in just right after this, we're going to go over to, uh, again, Elizabeth Harold and, and Sol about uh, Stand with Amazonia. So um, stay tuned. Oh, there they are. There they are. All right. So again, I want to thank Unify Network, Kaylin, Miranda Clandering, and all the folks there for their continued work to help the world be more, more connected and more coherent. So here we go uh, to our film. And I hope you enjoy um, Soil Solution to Climate Change. So we'll be back in just a few minutes uh, with lots more here on our broadcast. As global temperatures rise and erratic weather continues across the planet, people around the world are searching for a solution to climate change. As global temperatures rise and erratic weather continues across the planet, people around the world are searching for a solution. He's got it. Okay, it's a playable YouTube. I think Sergio is with Oh, it's on YouTube. It's on YouTube. Yeah, YouTube link is easy. I call it that. So, no, no, the planetary summit. If you were watching, just watch it. It's exciting. But the Sergio thing, look for a couple of things they just sent okay. you. Okay, I'm going to do that right now. And what you messed up with Rachel, not you, you messed up everything. 
we said, I am doing an interview at five and then doing an interview right after at six. So we're going to do something.
outside So I just want to say that uh, we're sharing the video, we're playing it, and I can hear it, but there seems to be uh, an issue with the broadcast. So I'm going to try one more time, and if not, we're just going to go right to the next um, interview with Elizabeth, and we'll bring Rachel back on. But it should be playing, but such is technology. So I'm going to try this again to share the screen. So I just want to say that uh, we're sharing the video. Okay. Share sound. Desktop. We can hear it now, Michael. There are many soils where we've depleted the carbon in them and where good agricultural practice could restore some of that carbon, which would increase the fertility of the soil. It would increase its ability to hold water. It would increase infiltration. You know, carbon in soil is just good for the soil and for the way we tend to use it. Um, but the carbon isn't gonna move from the atmosphere into the soil by itself. You know, water runs downhill because it does. Carbon moves into the soil because plants take it up and they fix it into, into leaves and roots and then that stuff dies and decomposes. So, you know, when I look at the way an ecosystem works, I like to talk about, well, there's the life history of plants and there's the death history of plants. And it's just as important because what happens to a plant after it dies is what controls whether the, soil, the carbon ends up in the soil. But the death history of plants is also the life history of microorganisms, of, of insects, of, of worms, of bacteria, and of fungi. And those are all the things that I study. You know, so it's like, yeah, I, like, you know, I study dead plants, and they're pretty cool. Healthy soil is alive with billions of organisms, including fungi, bacteria, and invertebrates. We depend on the invaluable array of beneficial ecosystem services they provide. The soil food web is all of the interactions of the different organisms that exist in soil performing all the processes to help plants grow in a healthy fashion. So the plant can have all the nutrients that it's supposed to have. It's not going to be subject to disease or uh, insect pests. We don't have to use inorganic fertilizers if we've got a good healthy food web. All those interactions are, are going on. Um, building soil structure, so water and oxygen move into the soil, um, making nutrients available back to the plants. So it's all of those sets of interactions. So if the soil food web microbes are what actually cause a plant to grow, assist it, immune system, food support, all of that. And we're a society that relies on food resources grown in the soils. Uh, then I don't see any way around it, but to say that all of a civilization is reliant on the health of the soil and the soil food web microbes. Soil organisms have a very important responsibility to return carbon to, to, to build the carbon pool that's in the soil. Um, these organisms, especially the fungi, uh, have the ability to eat these food resources that the plant provides. So the plant is fixing carbon from the atmosphere and upwards of a third of the carbon that that plant is sucking out of the air is being pumped into the soil and being fed to this fungi that's in the soil. And so when you have a healthy soil with all of its microbes and the oxygen exchange and the, the ample airspace and, and water storage that's in it, and you have this dynamic process that happens so that when we die, when the tree dies, when all of the things of life go back to the ground, that process is healthy, can then cycle that back through, break down everything into its element components, and then grow the new garden to allow the next generation to live.
The Marin Carbon Project, a collaborative group of researchers, scientists, ranchers, and farmers, is investigating how specific land management practices affect soil carbon levels. Using managed cattle grazing and compost application, they are testing to see if these methods increase the ability of rangeland or grassland soils to remove and store more carbon from the atmosphere. The easiest way to get at the question of could we sequester carbon in our rangeland soils was simply to add some. Add some carbon to the system and see what happened to it. And the easiest way for us to do that was to put some compost on the ground. So we decided to put about half an inch of compost out on some rangelands, both in Marin County and up in the Sierra foothills. And then we followed the course of that. We followed the course of carbon in those ecosystems for the next, well now going into the fourth year. The results were, on one hand, kind of what we expected. Yes, we were able to sequester carbon in those soils, but they were actually much better than we, we expected. Because not only did we increase soil carbon by the amount of carbon that we added in the compost, but we stimulated a change in those systems so that they were actually able to photosynthesize at a greater rate. In other words, their, the grasses were stimulated to grow and, and absorb more CO2 as carbon than they, than they would have had we not added the compost. Our treatment plots gained significant amounts of carbon, not only in the plant biomass above ground, where we saw a 50% increase in forage production, but we also saw a significant increase in below ground carbon. In addition, not only did we see an increase in below ground carbon, but we saw that carbon in a form that was long-term carbon. So the carbon shows up in different pools in the soil. Some of it tends to turn over rather quickly, and some of it sticks around for a long time. So we actually saw a significant increase in, in a, the occluded light fraction in the soil, which is carbon that's going to be there for a very long time. So it's very, very exciting results and, and actually much better than we had anticipated. Here's an a example of a purple needle grass, bunch grass. You can see the, kind of the size of the crown of this plant. And the roots on this are probably going down roughly two feet to three feet deep. And it's these native perennial bunch grasses that we're really hoping to encourage with our grazing practices. Uh, the helps in, in that it, it tends to remove the annual biomass and tends to give the uh, perennials a little more room to grow. Perennials are, are deeper rooted than the annuals. They're growing all year. So the annuals sort of disappear in the summertime and can tend to leave the soil bare or, or poorly covered. And the perennials are there for the duration. Some of these plants will live hundreds of years. So the Marine Carbon Project has established through our research that there's an intact mechanism that's distributed globally that has the potential to all of the atmospheric CO2 we need to remove to get down below 350 parts per million. What we're currently working on now is the calculation of the land area required to do just that. So now we're searching for the frequency. And we start with 100 hertz, and we look through the microscope to see if anything's happening. We watch for five minutes. Nothing happens. We try hundreds and hundreds of frequencies, if not thousands, until we find the magic combination. Grasses, if done properly, can be in a very effective way of getting CO2 out of the air and getting it in the ground in the form of the plant roots uh, for almost, for virtually ever. Because until somebody comes along and disturbs the soil, if nobody does that, then deep-rooted plants will, will hold that CO2 in the ground for an indefinite period of time until there's some disturbance that comes along. Much of the earth is covered in rangelands. These areas, if managed properly, may have the potential to sequester large amounts of carbon dioxide. The challenge with that is that you need to bury the carbon in the soil in a way that it stays buried. It's sort of the concept of a sort of zombie soil. You need to leave it in the ground. If, if you bury carbon in the ground, it may come back, you know, and be decomposed and released as CO2. And carbon isn't sequestered if it's only buried for a week or a year. Carbon needs to be for decades 
for it to really contribute to pulling carbon out of the atmosphere and fighting global warming. So we've done experiments where we take soil from a meter deep and, and the carbon in that soil is on average uh, several thousand years old. And then we incubate it in a lab and see how much carbon dioxide is produced by the bacteria and very little is. Um, but then you dry those soils and rewet them, and you dry them and rewet them, and each time you rewet them, you get another burst of carbon, and you grow a new population of microbes. And the carbon dioxide that's released when we when we carbon date it is six to eight hundred years old, on average. In nature, animals play an important role in building healthy soil by mimicking natural systems. Ranchers and land stewards can increase soil fertility, improve animal health and store more carbon in their soil. One of the, the, the primary benefits and need about all this is the grass-fed food link. And this, I came to this through our work with ranchers and farmers uh, in New Mexico. We began to look at not just local food systems, but going back to nature's model of grass-fed food, meaning that animals that eat grass their entire lives. They don't go into feedlots, they're not fed all that stuff. Uh, they they're eat grass, which is what nature wants them to do. And so there's a whole kind of thing around grass-fed food, which is healthier for you, frankly. I won't go into all the details. But the link then to climate and to carbon and soils is a, is a perfect fit, because these animals are on grass all their lives, right? So it's better for, as a consumer product to, to be eaten. It also brings more money to the rancher because it's a higher value. They can sell for a higher value. Uh, and if you manage the land properly, these animals are out there doing the carbon work for you. The chickens and the cows together form a very sustainable holistic system. What I mean by sustainable holistic is that we don't need very little external inputs in order to be able to raise those two breeds of animals. The, the cows naturally eat grass and the chickens follow the cows through the pasture and what they do is they do uh, several things for us. The first is they dig through the cow manure patties and while the instinct is to scratch and they will vacuum up all those nasty bugs that really bother our cows. So in the form of fly larvae and eggs and those kind of things. The second thing they do is by nature, virtue of the fact that they're scratching, they spread out the cow manure. So I don't need a tractor anymore to go out there and do that for me, thereby saving a lot of diesel fuel. So now I have an animal doing my work for me, which is really great, because that's what it's all about. And then the third thing they do for me is um, they provide for us that makes the grass grow back nice and thick and lush. That allows us to put the cows back on and it all the way down again, so it forms a nice, close system. Come on. Of grazing that we're doing here is management intensive grazing. And there's a few other names for it. People also call it mob grazing. And the general idea is you get a big mob of cows and you get them in an area of grass where they can eat all the grass and move them on to the next place. And then you don't bring them back until the grass is fully mature again. They will graze the area they're in in 24 hours. So at this time tomorrow, we'll be moving them one step forward. Nature likes to farm with animals. Nature's always farmed with animals. Bison. Running across a big plain and stopping and eating is a form of agriculture, in a sense. I know that sounds kind of crazy, but if you go back, that's what they were doing. They, there's a relationship between grass and grazers. It goes back millions and millions of years, not with cattle, of course, but with herbivores, wild herbivores, eating and moving on. So that, that relationship between grass that grows and it gets eaten, and the roots go out and the roots grow up and all that sort of stuff, has been going on for a long, long time. And what many ranchers that we work with are trying to get back to that model, back to sort of nature's image of grazing in arid and semi-arid landscapes. 
Uh, and once you start mimicking that, then you have healthier ecosystems. And now we know that means more carbon sequestered in soils. So it's really, really a nice loop all the way around from the sun to the soils to the plants to the food uh, to you. So we've actually never grazed this area uh, with electric fencing. This used to be harvested with our tractors. Uh, so this is, you know, a real uh, change, basically, a real conversion in a, a more sustainable way of doing things. So we're in the process of learning how we do this, and, and so far we've seen really good results. And uh, it's pretty interesting to see what the cows actually do here. Do you guys see this right here? It's called Audible. There's actually a better way to make money on Amazon. It might be settings on display. Okay. Come on now. Tell them right off to try in a minute. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Well, here they come. In terms of you know what they can do for us they're much better at tilling up the soil um, you could see they leave you know, a lot of pock marks in the ground and and they push in some of the green matter and they allow it to compost better uh, they also allow these pockets where water can accumulate so if it rains we absorb a lot more water than a place that's been tilled flat because there's all these little cups essentially that can catch the water and let it slowly filter in it also increases the surface area of the field by making it more corrugated. So there's more places for seeds to germinate. Livestock, whether they're chickens, cattle, or pigs, whatever, they're, they're important because they, they will eat the, the organic matter. They'll eat the grass and the, the leaves and, and branches, and they'll convert it into manure. And that manure is so nutrient dense, and it's also, um, organic matter dense and you, you lay that down and then, then, then you, the grass grows in it and then they eat it again, they lay it down, it builds topsoil over time. This hen is, weighs about eight pounds and she'll eat about her weight in food every month, every month. And a lot of that, a lot of that uh, food can come be kitchen scraps or scraps from the garden. They can be chicken biorecyclers, and what that does is it diverts the, uh, the, the food scraps from the solid waste management system, which is wonderful, so that decreases taxpayer dollars. But it gets even better because then you can use that nitrogen-rich manure and combine it with leaf and yard waste and compost it and can keep all the leaf and yard waste out of the solid waste management system. So that's how they can be clucking civic service workers and truly save taxpayer dollars. And at the same time, then, you say you get topsoil to grow your food in. I mean, it's a beautiful cycle when you complete the loop. The beauty of, of all of this is that anyone who has the, the access to a piece of land, and it could be your backyard, it could be a flower box, um, has the capacity to participate in this process. So really it's about just getting out on the land and engaging with it um, intentionally, um, knowledgeably, but proactively to begin to accelerate the rate at which we're building soil carbon. Climate change and our impact upon the environment will determine our future. Anything that we do to increase soil fertility could be a step in reversing climate change. Through land management practices, we can take excess carbon out of the atmosphere and put it to beneficial use in the soil. What if a solution to climate change was found in the ground beneath our feet? Right. So it's a very nice touch. Almost like I know what I'm doing. <laughs> you must have done a good job of getting the diver emphasis. By the way, why aren't we broadcasting? Because I need editors working. I, I need, you know what I need? To keep my staff employed. Okay. Put holes in my land. Here we go. Okay, we're gonna go live again.
All right, and I think uh, I think we're back. Uh, Rachel Linden, you're there. I know uh, got Elizabeth and Soul there. So uh, I'm going to stop the video. Give me one moment. Okay, great. All right, Hi, so we, see you we again. are back. You too. And uh, I think we have Soul on the call too, correct? Correct. Soul Absolutely. Is in the house. Ooh, hey, wow. Michael. I am, I am overwhelmed by amazingly powerful, empowered women. This is incredible. I'm so Aren't honored. <laughs> so Look at the men we're invited by. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Beautiful. So uh, I want to thank Rachel Linden. She's welcome to stay on the call. And she's, she's really put together over 20 amazing films. And uh, just to kind of keep us on track, uh, keep us on track. I want to thank her for her amazing contribution to organic land care and helping to keep the environment uh, non-toxic. So Rachel Linden, thank you so much. Uh, again, we'll, we'll have you drop in anytime over the next day or so you want to drop in. We'll continue. And we have many more great films coming up. And I do want to remind people we're going to be starting the film festival in just a few minutes on our second channel. So, and also we're broadcasting into the virtual world uh, in partnership with Rachel Tice and Microsoft and uh, Greg and many others. So uh, again, Rachel, any last words of wisdom before we switch over to uh, Elizabeth and Soul? It's all about the relationships, right? Um, between people and between us and nature and the microbes in the soil. It's all about working together, right? Um, and that's, that's where the future is for humanity. That's where the future is for the planet. <laughs> I like what that. is the caliber of our relationships? There you go. Beautiful segue into being together. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So uh, with that, I want to welcome uh, to the broadcast today, Elizabeth Harold, who uh, we share a watershed together up there in uh, the Yoruba River area. And also, uh, I'm not sure where she's calling it. I know she's quite a world traveler and you can usually find her wherever the, the hot spot is or things need to be done. I know uh, her and Elizabeth have joined together, but I want to welcome to the broadcast uh, Sol Abrosa. So welcome. Thank you so much, Michael. It's such an honor and a pleasure to be here. And Rachel, I'm totally intrigued and I feel like I want to go through your library and watch everything. Elizabeth, thank you for the connection and the invitation to uh, your water world. <laughs> and, Happy and where Earth are you Day, everyone. Happy Earth Day. And where are you calling in from, Seoul? Tel Aviv, Israel. Oh, what time is it, Sol? What time is it? Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> Thank <Don't> you. <laughs> Good question. I'm on Elizabeth's time. Whatever E.T. E <laughs> e and, and going so, home. <laughs> yeah. So when she comes, when she comes to the States, she'll be, she won't have any jet lag at all. <laughs> no jet lag. Yeah. Wow. Great. Well, I'm really, uh, looking forward to this discussion with you and, uh, even though we're talking a lot about solutions and keeping things very uh, positive, uh, we're still looking at what's happening in the world because it helps people to realize um, what time it is on the planet. And hope, hopefully we want to inspire people to action, advocacy, and activism. So I know uh, you've been doing a lot of work for a long time about Stand with Amazonia. Um, so for people watching and just to get me up to speed, uh, what's the current situation and what is stand with Amazonia and, and what, what's happening? Elizabeth, would you like to set it up or shall I start? Um, what's happening is our mother river is being murdered. It's as simple as that. This is the mother river of the planet and she is uh, basically being annihilated and the legislation of the governments that are uh, and the corporations that are coveting her biodiversity for their own profit are poised and ready to pass constitutional legislation that will strip the protections of the indigenous lands, which are protecting uh, a lot of the intact forest. And um, there's an election coming up and 
the world really needs to stand up and say, you do not have permission to jeopardize the future of life on earth. So Elizabeth, a, are, these yeah. cri- are, are these crimes against the earth, are they being committed through the global trade agreements? Absolutely, they are. And Mercosur and, national. And, and, and the war in Ukraine. So the war in Ukraine is pushing it because uh, Ukraine used to be the breadbasket of the world and Russia, uh, specifically Ukraine. And so, so now Brazil's stepping up and saying, we can, we can take care of that. We've got lots of fertilizer, which they don't, and lots of land that we can plant, which they don't. They do, but they don't, right? It's, it's our lungs, it's our heart, it's our heartbeat. Um, so there's, there's a lot going on. And the key to this uh, urgency and this imperative that we really have to pay attention to as a species and really come together, like in a way that we have never come together before, is that it's code red for humanity and that the Amazon is a biome that puts more um, photosynthesis into the system, um, affecting the climate all over the planet. Uh, the fires in California are direct, directly related. The rain at the top of Greenland last year is directly related. The droughts in Africa are all directly related to the destruction and deforestation of the Amazon. And the science, climate scientists, uh, the biologists all agree that between 23 and 25 percent is the tipping point where a uh, intact biome begins to collapse upon itself and cannot regenerate and begins a process of downward spiral exponentially to desertification. And um, we're currently at 22% deforestation of the Amazon. And that's only the Amazon. That's not counting the Atlantic forest. It's not counting to the um, Serrano. It's not count, you know, all the Pantanal, all the other biomes in Brazil that are already in that process of um, deforestation. So it, it is, it is time, time is now. There's, there's no, this is not a dress rehearsal. So as you see, I dressed up. (laughs) Yes. And and I know recently, I I know recently Seoul went to a, a, a global conference or symposium. Can you tell us a little bit about what happened there? And also the, um, the ability for indigenous communities to actually speak at that event and, and what that event was, so. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, um, I what I think you're referring to COP26 and uh, that pre-COP, et cetera, uh, because we're still coming back from Corona and in-person events. Um, the, the, the one thing I wanted to say before I transition into that, and perhaps it'll help me segue, um, is above all, um, it's funny, I said this earlier on a different broadcast. Um, some people come up to me and they're like, oh, come on, that's old news. Ugh, people, my parents and grandparents were talking about the Amazon. And I'm like, yep, I remember that when I was a kid. However, it's time, baby. It's time. Why? Because now is the time that we're at this point that we're kissing the tipping point. And um, then I looked at myself. I don't even think I've told Elizabeth this yet, but like I realized that six months ago, a video that we'd made was still relevant, like very relevant. And I looked at myself, I was like, wait, if I post this now, people are going to be like, you posted that six months ago. How can you say the same thing then that you're saying now, which was that the Brazilian government was about to change the constitution and this would help expedite um, deforestation, et cetera. And then I thought to myself, duh, it's because of the things that we're doing that we're able to delay and buy time. That's the goal we've had all along is like buy time and get awareness and then get resources and then, you know, solve the problem. But we're like at the point where, okay, okay, okay. We're stretching the time, we're stretching the time. But at the same time, we're stretching drops, little droplets of water while the government with all their money and the fossil fuel companies and the agro businesses with their billions of dollars are up against voluntary 
um, concerned citizens of the world, right? It's kind of like, uh, not the simplest um, thing to like pull Titanic away from the iceberg before we hit it. So I think that's where what Elizabeth was saying and also Rachel earlier um, about coming together that we need to do something at an unprecedented, unprecedented level. And I think that's where the system change comes in. And that's where like these um, prophecies and so on say like, oh, the new world, the new world, you know, it's gonna take time to get to a new world. Um, I don't think anyone's walking around with like the solution and the plan. I think it's the combination of all of us and, and figuring out how to, um, how to do it on a, on a systemic scale so that our species can survive in time. Um, that was my, that thought about COP26, et, et cetera. Um, yeah, it's a challenge for multiple reasons. And I'm learning that with time um, to get the indigenous voices at the table. So one thing is, well, they're far away. Another is, their culture, mentality, and lifestyle is very different to ours and might not work in the same way. Third is that for them to like kind of, let's say, take the example of leaving the forest and flying to these congressional, you know, gatherings that we have, it's, it takes a, it, it's resources they don't even work with oftentimes. I mean, they've got water, they've got food as long as the ecosystem's healthy and that's how they live and it's not 100% exact like that. And you've got, of course, modern and, and different like um, levels of exposure that they've had, um, you know, to the white Western world for lack of a better world, uh, a word, lack of a better word. <laughs> and, um, and I just think that it makes the entire thing challenging and even for the decision makers to be able to hear their voices, you know, that it's, an, it's a unique opportunity. So what we've been doing is, well, more and more often, however we can, pass the mic, pass the stage, just give it to them in any way possible, including tonight uh, on a broadcast, you know, that in itself is also, um, achieving the same goal of amplification. And I think that that's why I like to really focus on education because I think awareness is um, the root cause of most of the challenges that we have. It's about the impact of our choices and why do we choose those things? Because we think whatever we think of them and then um, therefore, education, I think, is key, and it's at any age. And so for COP26, yeah, it was very challenging to see, but we also, uh, I also did see in civil society supporting COP26, a whole lot of love for the Indigenous. And I think that this time they were noticed more than before, and, it, and I, I will definitely um, be happy to see that it continues to grow. Uh, until balance. And, and a question I have is, and I know Elizabeth has spoken about this, it's so easy for people to be um, hyper involved or even uh, distracted in all of the issues in our own communities. So, mm -hmm. so when, when you talk about stand with Amazonia and the Amazon, and I know it's a very obvious question, but I just want to kind of be the, uh, the pol polar, pol polarized um, advocate right now. Why should people care on a global level about what's happening to uh, indigenous communities and to the environment in the Amazon? And how does that impact the world? Should I grab that, Elizabeth, and then you add? Or I'm, I'm, I'm going to jump in for that. Go um, ahead. Thanks. Well, I actually love that question. And I love that question more now than I did two years ago because we're after a pandemic. And basically, um, while learning about climate change, you know that pandemics are part of the name of the game. But also, uh, 
the behavior of a pandemic spreading um, is kind of like climate change and uh, everything on the planet, actually in the universe, everything affects everything, right? Water, molecules, air, everything is actually constantly um, cause and effect. And so um, what I think is what I like about that question is the fact that it's more about the expansion of the mind and connecting our uh, idea of life and why it is the way it is and how it works to whole systems thinking. And therefore, if you understand the way a whole system works, um, like your wheels in the clock, like um, the faucet, like, like things have to have all the pieces in place to work. And so, the same way people are like, oh, come on, Corona's in China. That's so far away from me. Or a sadder example, and I'm, you know, example of it is, oh, uh, cancer is like in another family and, you know, it could come to you. We're all human. And that is the bottom line. Um, so I think um, making that connection that we are part of something much greater and every butterfly wing does affect every other atom and cell in the universe infinitely, fractally, is, um, is just conceptually something that would be wonderful if more humans on the planet could conceive of. And, and, uh, and, so and just... Go ahead, Elizabeth. Yeah, just just the mass of biological processes that are involved in the Amazon basin and how huge it is. Like we we see it on a map and we we go, oh yeah, that's a big space. But um, if you really look at um, the living heartbeat that comes out of the Amazon through the seasons, um, it's, it's very, very significant. And so if we, if, if we destroy that, um, and, and, and that, that moisture, it, it's like a flying river, right? It's, it's, it's the generator of our climate. It, it, it is the source of our, our water cycle. That the, it comes off of the like the moisture of the Andes rises uh, or the Amazon rises up to the Andes, it goes up in the air and it goes over to Africa and it feeds the rainforest there in Africa. And then it it moves around the river, you know, in, into into the Caribbean and the Gulf. And you can see that pattern if you are able to get a perspective um, kind of above the ground. And um, you know, beyond that, really recognizing that for myself, water is alive. If if all of life on Earth is coming from water, then water itself has to be living. It's a it's a living entity. Our Earth is a living planet, and um, you know that's one of the things of why we need the awareness building and the science is because we need to put these decision makers on notice, right? They have to be told because if they make these well, decisions, then, then they are responsible for making poor decisions and can be hold, held accountable for the eco side that results. Well, it's kind of like from their standpoint, in one decision, one person or a few people can actually systematically protect us, you know, from calamity. That's obvious to the choir, um, but I think um, that the question of why someone should care is really a question of showing the connection. And I think, you know, there's water, there's air, there's soil, um, and the Amazons, as you said, Elizabeth, I think the sheer size is the reason why it stands out different from anything else um, because there are other rainforests coming close to their own tipping points 
uh, as we speak, Africa being one of them, um, that if they collapse, it's going to be devastating and awful and savannification and all that. But it apparently, to the best of my knowledge, currently based on IPCC and other experts, um, is that the Amazon's size could actually like push our species towards extinction or darn close to it enough that it would be right. worse than any Hollywood movie, I think. Well, well, well let's do the Can we just There's talk so about some solutions a little bit? Really, uh, uh, absolutely. I, before we do that, I also want to say uh, goodbye to one of our associate producers, Rachel Linden from Non-Toxic Communities and Green Lifestyles. She has a uh, next Earth Day uh, advocacy <laughs> event, and I know she does a lot, but I want to thank her uh, for her time and commitment to put together our film festival, which we'll continue to putting out thank there. You, and uh, Rachel, before you go, did you have any last words you want to say, Rachel Linden, and then we'll go back to the Amazon. And then in just a few minutes, we also, uh, I know we have a video, and we also have an interview with Alan, Professor Alan Tratner and uh, David with Organic by Nature, who's doing a whole line of plastic-free packaging that are coming out in awareness. So we'll keep it moving, but Rachel Linden, any last words you wanna share before we switch gears? No, ladies, keep up that good fight, rights of nature. That's where it's at right now. And I'll tell you what we do locally, it really does make a difference globally in a lot of ways. Um, you know, the, the USGS used to, our government used to measure how much pesticides or certain pesticides were measurable in rainwater all across the country. And how it gets there isn't just your lawn maintenance or what's happening at your park, what's being flown over um, the national forests and, and crop dusted over crops via either helicopter or plane, that drifts, that gets put up into the, to the atmosphere and that can go hundreds or thousands of miles and I really am very concerned about the biome of the earth, not just the soil, but I mean the atmosphere and what complications will come from having that much poison raining down on nature mm -hmm. and in perpetuity, because some of these chemicals, I mean, half lives of 50, 100 years. And so they won't just pollute for a few days. It will be pollute for lifetimes. And that really concerns me. And so the, the use of those chemicals, just like in any circumstance, whether it's on your food or in your lawn or on your park, it's just, it's investing in the wrong outcome. And, and for what it's worth for the countries that are considering um, cutting down their rainforest for an economic boom, look, in, in the United States, we get it in, a, we're just getting it now. We're paying farmers to sequester carbon. We're looking for carbon sequestration solutions. If, if the idea that the Amazon were in danger and investors could keep the Amazon from being commodified, I believe that that would be most certainly of interest to, to everyone, especially people with money. So Talking whatever to you. works out there, to um, blessings to you. We're and your people. Life. Keep it up, ladies. Have a good yeah, night. Yeah, we have. Thank you, Rachel. And save the soil. Save, save the, the soil. soil. Save the air. Save the water. Save the trees. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah, yeah. Great. So, Rachel Linden, thank you so much. And a big, uh, much appreciation to Green Lifestyles and Non Toxic Communities and for uh, bringing the film festival. And uh, we'll be broadcasting all the way till 10 o'clock tomorrow night. I know Elizabeth and Soul have. A, a piece of media that they want to show. So I'm going to make Elizabeth um, the hostess right now. And then we're going to bring David on in here in a few minutes. So David, please be patient with us. And I see that you're on camera and we'll get to you in just a moment. And we have a partner here too. So um, let me give Elizabeth hostess privileges and uh, we'll go from there. Okay, so you're, you're the, now the host, Elizabeth. Thank you, Michael. I'll let um, Sol um, set up the solutions. Uh, that we've come up with, we, you know, yeah. so many of us have been doing this for so many years, 
Um, we've done a lot of thinking on it, and now it's time to execute those plans. That's right, Elizabeth. Um, and I think with the Watershed Wisdom Council's theory and uh, this beautiful water family uh, that we're, I'm sitting with tonight um, is, is a nice example of biomimicry that um, actually helped us find each other. And so basically for the last 13 years or so, I, in my spare time, started a little, I guess, life project that brought me to this conversation now um, and other people uh, parallel to me, but it, I was curious to see what it would take. Do we have what it takes? Can we make it as a species? And just really went around the world looking for solutions that are out there. Really, I started through education, as I said earlier, and then found myself wanting to show everyone what I'd found and give everyone at least one of each of the things that I'd found. And I'd found so much that it was too much. I had to actually stop and I was like, wow, okay. And then um, fast forward a few years later, decided I wanna find a way to dedicate myself to be able to doing this. And uh, here we are on one of the, uh, monumental dates uh, that we've been waiting for to start actually fundraising with fun uh, and get gathering resources basically to build a platform that maps out the sustainable solutions that exist and educational content and then make them accessible to a critical mass as soon as possible and in order to do that um, we've kind of come up with a campaign that um, I, I can sh do the hand signals, yeah? Okay. Yeah. A campaign that actually is uh, started when I was a child-ish. I was born into a musical family. My mother and father produced a song. My parents are musicians, my father a musician, my mother was his manager, and um, they produced UNICEF's 50th anniversary anthem. And I was a kid at the time. And my brothers, my cousins, my friends from school, we all went to the music studio with my parents and we recorded this song and made a music video. And it was basically an answer to how are we going to help other children in the world who are less fortunate than us. And um, it's called together. And so fast forward, however many years later, here I am. Uh, I've been carrying that song in my heart. It's really inspired a lot of who I am today. Um, and we would, we are going to, we are launching a TikTok challenge with hand signals and hashtags um, and inviting everyone to challenge 10 more people, tag them and pass it on and have them tag 10 more piece of people and pass it on. I dare say, Michael, you might be receiving a challenge. A challenge. Because <laughs> uh -huh. we're challenging ourselves, challenge humanity. So the hand signal goes like this. We are one. Open it up. It's a B. Is it looking like a B on your side? Yes. Mm -hmm. Together, we are being based on three principles of respect to ourselves, others, and life. It's about me, it's about we, and together we are being and D, doing. Together they create an infinity. Together we're building a home made with love. And together we rise up to be one. And so uh, there's uh, the song. We're going to um, invite people to sing the chorus, record themselves, and then. Um, challenge 10 people to do the same. And Elizabeth, I think you've got a video queued up. Mm -hmm. I think we can introduce it. I hope you guys enjoy it. This is the original. Sacrifice. 
sacrifice in a world not of their making. Everyone in their own little world wondering how did it get this way. We all start out as a boy or a girl with hopes and dreams we pray that life can Together, we are being based on three principles of respect to ourselves, others, and life. It's about me, it's about we, and together we are being and de doing. Together, we create an infinity. Together, we're building a home made with love. And together, we rise up to be one. Be one, voice your choice. We'll do it one day with everyone on camera. I look forward to it. <laughs> Incredible. Thank you. So um, we're, we're, I know there's so much we could talk about. And just to have you live on this Earth Day broadcast from Tel Aviv and Elizabeth from up in uh, Nevada County area and here with the co-founder of Earth Day here in <laughs> one Ventura. Of one of the founders. <laughs> and so... <laughs> and uh you know the fact that we're streaming on social media and also we're streaming into the virtual world uh we have greg and rachel here in support from microsoft uh just how many you know people that came together to help me possible and we're and and you know what i've been saying today the reason we didn't try to do a huge event publicly facing is because we're all meeting each other we're getting more coherent more connected we're building our core group synergy and and we're we're really 
creating solutionaries that are doing amazing work like you and Elizabeth with the uh, stand with Amazonia. And of course, your, your father, correct, with that amazing piece of music and his work with UNICEF and all of these pieces coming together. Um, I do know we have uh, David coming up in just a couple of minutes. We also have Kevin Danaher coming on, the founder of Green Festival and uh, kind of a celebrity on the TEDx network and lots of other great stuff. But let's just take another couple of minutes and, and we'll bring this people involved. How can we inspire people to stand with Amazonia and to get involved in the movement? I think that's an excellent question. And to close with, um, I think it's part of why I chose this song. Any action, even a fraction, makes a difference in the end. So if there's any curiosity that uh, is even struck in someone, go read about it. Whatever you find out, share it. Um, let other people know about it. And in this case, um, there are actually, you can go to www.standwithamazonia.com. There's a bunch of volunteers who are putting together kind of a, a consolidated uh, website of information and actions you can take. Um, and there's also the platform that we are uh, building a piece by piece organically. It's like beautiful how it's coming together. Uh, as you said, Michael, um, people just coming together for the cause and starting with that. Uh, it's called Be, which is why we're doing a campaign called Be Together. And the invitation is to be one. The website is be1.life. And um, yeah, it's just a project that's unfolding um and really beautiful um thank you for having me us here i'll pass it to elizabeth for for her closing words and i want to thank everyone and anyone who's here and watching at any given moment thank you for your hearts for caring um for our future and our mother earth uh, I'm, I'm i can't believe i'm here with you on earth stock well we got plans we're going to be coming over there to uh israel at some point there's a lot of doors opening so thank you yeah we'll I'm talk here. more about that and uh, i don't want to keep him waiting too long i just want to also acknowledge elizabeth harold uh and all the work that she does and the watershed uh wisdom councils and I want to give her a moment for share some words of wisdom. I also want to make sure we get the host back before you guys jump off the call or you're welcome to stay on. Uh, I'm really intrigued about talking to David uh, Sandoval, who is doing some amazing work. Um, and uh, I'm just getting to know him, but he was brought to us by Professor Alan Trattner. Uh, he'll be talking about he's the founder of the Plastic Free Packaging Alliance. So, again, let's and let's start to regenerate some of the damage that's been done. And it takes heart, it takes spirit, it takes teamwork to make the dream work. You're here. So uh, Elizabeth Harold, any last words you'd like to share? And then we'll go over to uh, Professor Allen and David. Yeah, uh, first of all, I really want to thank David for what he's doing. I mean, how many times do we get one apple wrapped in plastic, right? It's like, what? Why? <laughs> it's to sell plastic, that's why. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's like enough, 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 enough. I make my own yogurt because I assessed that that was the biggest use of, my, you know, was my biggest plastic use. So I've eliminated that. But there's so many things you can't eliminate. And so it really has to come on an industrial level. And that takes wisdom of the citizens. It, it takes the citizens, the civilians to raise our awareness, to raise our wisdom, to organize around that wisdom as much as we need to draw down our bad behavior. I mean, thank you, Paul Hawkins. Right. We need to draw down our bad behavior. We at the same time need to draw up our wisdom and, and meet in the middle in action and not just look around and or hide our head in the sands and say it's it'll work itself out because it's not. After 50 years, 52 years of Earth Days, we're still protesting this shit. I, and I want to thank you for creating <laughs> Earth Day. Thank you. Yeah. Being part of it. Thank yeah. You. Well, I will say this, what's really interesting too, you know, I, I'm a student of the Mayan calendar and study. Of course. Mm -hmm. I'm also an interfaith minister. And I, I, try, I try to do the advocacy, activism, stewarding work I do by inspiring people's hearts. Because if we can touch someone's hearts, we inspire them mm -hmm. to make change. I, I, there's so much information in the world. People know what the problems are. So, you know, by inspiring people, we can really 
uh, help to you know make a big difference. So again, I know um, both of you as amazing human beings, and and the men the men are learning to step aside and, and let the women take their rightful place and, and take their roles of Together. leadership. And the work Together. they're doing is really. <laughs> Really incredible. So thank you uh, so much, both of you. And uh, with that, I'm going to, uh, again, make sure I've got the host back and you I'm going to turn it over to Professor Alan Tratner. Thank you so much, Michael. We're going to have a, a great discourse about sol solutions. Thank you. And thank you for connecting us with Unify. It was great to have that happening today with Miranda and, and Kaylin. So thank you again yeah. for all our collaboration, Elizabeth. Much yeah. love and respect and appreciation. Big honors, yeah. All Stay around. around the world, folks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Right. And with Looking that, with that I'm going to turn more, it over right? to Professor Alan Tratner. Absolutely. And it looks like David's on camera. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to... Uh... Uh, David has his... Uh, you got your microphone on mute, David, and it's you and uh, Alan Tratner for the next few. So thank you. Thank you. Great work, ladies. Amazing stuff. Hi, David. Good evening. David, this is terrific to have this opportunity. I want to thank you for joining us. I, uh, first of all, I'd like the audience in the world about your success first in your companies, what you've created, the philosophy of the companies, and then let's get into this whole new alliance that I'm helping you with that is about the Plastic Free Pack Alliance and how the industry, how you can lead the industry and help the industry move in a big way. So I'm really appreciative of that. So why don't you tell uh, everyone about your companies? Well, um, yeah. Can you so, hear me, David? Yes, could you hear me? Yes, I can, can hear you. Can you hear me, Alan? Okay, yes. good. Well, First of all, thank you uh, for inviting me on to this Earth Day Summit. Uh, really, really appreciate everybody who's taking the time out of their day to either enlighten, educate, or entertain themselves, um, uh, you know, with the information that's being offered. And, you know, for me, I am the type I, I was talking today about how you know, um, everybody grows up watching movies about superheroes. You know, everybody grows up watching movies about superheroes and they don't believe that they actually could be one. They think that those are just on television. And I want to let you know, every single one of you know that you are capable of and you currently are, you know, just a superhero in waiting that you personally could massively impact the world. And I want to use my life as an example, you know, for people, you know, to say that I can. You know, if you hear about something horrible happening, don't wait for someone else to fix it. Be the solution, you know, step up and go out and make something happen. And so um, in my life, that's been sort of my my thing. I uh, if you read about me, if you Google me and I'm not saying you have to, but Inc. Magazine um, wrote an article about my journey from homelessness to being a successful businessman, you know, no high school or college, you know, um, credits to my, to my name, uh, graduation and you know, didn't graduate from high school or go to college. And yet, um, I managed to find my way in this world. And, um, I managed to find my way by doing good by other people. And I learned that pretty early. So I'm going to give you a tiny bit of the story just so you get some background and then we're going to move forward, fast forward to, to now. But, uh, there was a time I was homeless and I had all of my possessions in a plastic bag three pairs of pants, uh, you know, four shirts and a few uh, pairs of socks, one pair of shoes on my feet. And one day I came out of my little homeless area where I was living near the beach and I saw a couple of guys who had been beaten up and left for dead on the beach. And I needed to help them because here was somebody that was more desperate than me. So I went over and I offered my help and they were afraid because they had just been beaten and they didn't know who I was. So I let them know that despite my appearance, I was there to help them. So I let them use some of my, uh, you know, some of my uh, clothes because theirs were torn. And when I looked in my bag after I gave Dan and this other gentleman, I can't remember his name. Uh, I think it was Chris, but I gave them each a pair of pants and I gave them each a shirt. When I looked in the bag, I had one pair of pants and one shirt left. And I knew 
that the shirt on my back and the pants on my body were going to have to last a while, you know, because I didn't have a chance to wash my clothes too much. So I gave away half of what I had. And it reminded me of a saying that Jesus said, he said, if you have two and your brother has none, then you must give one. And there I was with the ability to practice that, you know, to actually make that real. And I thanked great creator for the opportunity to actually live a lesson of Christ in that time in my life. And something miraculous happened. Those two fellas turns out they lived in Hawaii and they were grateful to me. And they found a way through a mailing address. I gave them of a friend to send me a round trip ticket to Hawaii. And I jumped on a plane and I went there and my life's never been the same because when I went there, I saw opportunities that I took advantage of and I raised myself out of homelessness and I raised myself out of poverty by helping other people. And it was pretty amazing. And so I will fast forward um, to a point in my life where I um, was a stockbroker, believe it or not. And I was fat and rich and sick. <laughs> and I had just, for some reason, I had decided that all this foo-foo stuff of living off the land and being nature boy and all that, that that was, that, that wasn't like what, you know, that wasn't a sign of success. I wanted people to see me as a success. So I bought into that, that thing, that matrix, that job paycheck matrix. And I was very successful, Beverly Hills my own, you know, my own office, you know, millions of dollars of other people's money that I was managing. And I was miserable, so miserable. And I was fat and I was sick, but I had money. And then one day the stock market crashed. This was in the mid eighties. Some people remember. And we invaded Iraq. Uh, the first Iraq war under the old Bush, the first Bush. And oil prices went to $150 and things got crazy, you know? Um, and, uh, and so I found myself a homeless person. I found myself living in the streets, you know, like I said, but, but um, I found opportunities too. And I worked my way through that. And so when I became a stockbroker, it was to sort of show the world that, hey, you know, yeah, I succeeded as a hippie. But now I'm going to succeed as a, as a businessman. And I did. I did real good. And then when that stock market crashed in the mid-80s, I was lucky enough to know it. And I put a lot of my money against the market. So when it fell, I made money. And I needed to know what to do with that money. So I went back to Hawaii. And I went to this special sacred place. And I began to pray. And the voice of God just spoke to me and said, you know what to do. You've been there before, go back. And I did. And at that point I decided to get, dedicate my life to things, you know, to special things. So I don't, I don't want to belabor the story too much. But when I was homeless, my auntie took me off of the streets and she showed me love and she gave me a home and she fed me abundant food. When I grew up so hungry all the time, being poor as I was. And then all of a sudden she died. And the doctor said it was the food that killed her. It was all the chemicals, the preservatives, the coloring agents in the food that she ate so abundantly that killed her. And I found my first villain and I put my cape on and I said, it's time to superhero up because there's a villain out there killing my auntie and I want my revenge. And I went to war against the companies that made those chemicals. I went to war and I started a company called Organic by Nature. Organic by Nature was gonna prove that we we're all supposed to be organic, that a hundred years ago, all food was organic. A hundred years ago, there were no chemicals on this earth. And I wrote a book called The Toxin That Came to Dinner that documents the correlation between chemical usage and suffering, human suffering, a direct correlation between the increase of human suffering and disease and the increase of these pesticides and chemicals. And it's a direct correlation, it's undeniable. 
And again, I remember that as a child, I said, why can't I be a superhero? And I just decided I was going to identify villains like the chemicals in food. And I was going to be the superhero that came up with a solution that saved humanity okay. from this villain. And that's where it all started. You know, that's where it all started, okay. Alan, and you're, with that, with my auntie. You're the model of what our theme. Yeah, you're the model of our theme. Solutionaries. You're a living example. And, and it's, I'm so proud of you and knowing you. Uh, I should mention t- to our listeners and our viewers that one of the, we're going to get into the Plastic Free Packaging Alliance, this new industry driven thing that uh, he's going to tell you about and that we're working on to affect the entire industry that packages food. But I will tell you the other way I met uh, David in the first place was that he also has sponsored a a terrific, remarkable, innovative uh, project, a retreat, a special retreat for helping autistic families. And, and that's, it's called the Awaken Project. We actually helped them set up their nonprofit, get a tax exempt. And I was there with my little son, Quest, a couple of years ago and watched a remarkable transformation take place at this Awaken retreat. And we're now gonna take this to a different level and uh, we're thrilled to do that. So I, I just, that's how I met David in the first place. But now we're working together on this new alliance. So, and I want you to explain your mission and what you're intending to do. <clears throat> so um, again, yes. So the Plastic Free Packaging Alliance it is, you know, I, I want to just fast forward really quickly. Like he said, when I learned about the problem with glyphosate, it's the same as when I learned about, you know, what killed my auntie and I needed to put my cape on again. And we went out and we created a nutritional solution to glyphosate and we ran a clinical trial and we proved that we could actually eliminate another scourge, another villain from our bodies called glyphosate. And we could do that using a superhero tool that we created for you called Biomedic that is clinically proven to reduce glyphosate by 75% in just six weeks. And, and that was, you know, in answer to this problem of glyphosate and, and then the same thing with, with autism. You see, I don't think there's any problem too big for us to tackle. I don't think there's anything bigger than us because if we created the problem, we could undo the problem. The fire we started, we could put out and we're responsible for putting out. That's been, so here I was with the company. Yeah, David, there's a little delay. No, no, there's a little delay. We're getting used to that. So here I was with a company that was named one of the fastest growing companies in the United States by Inc. Magazine, three out of four years, because my message about chemical free food, about organic food, about, you know, these foods that don't have binders, fillers, excipients, preservatives, or additives. I created the most efficient delivery system of organic food in the history of the planet to create the lowest food print for the consumers of organic food that has ever been possible to help fight against this rise in, you know, in, in, in global warming. But then I realized that all that beautiful food I was sending out was being sent out in plastic tubs, plastic packages with plastic scoops and plastic lids. And I looked myself in the mirror and I said, you, sir, are the problem. <laughs> you are the problem. And if you're the problem, you could be the solution. And so I began to investigate and I invested in companies that were creating hemp and bamboo, uh, you know, um, like alternatives to plastic. And they were terrible and they didn't work very well. And we kept investing, we kept experimenting, we kept believing it was possible. And year after year, we got better. And year after year, it became more viable. And finally, just a few years ago, three short years ago, we found an alternative, a bamboo hemp alternative to plastic that could hold the quality of our food, the integrity of our food, a moisture barrier, you know, a germ barrier, all the things to make sure that your food is pure and safe and and fresh inside of that packaging. And it didn't have to be plastic. 
And so since that time, we began to migrate and to experiment. And we moved first in uh, 2019, we made the commitment that by 2000, the end of 2021, we would be a plastic free company. And we began to migrate and experiment and move over. And as of one month ago, we had displaced. Now displacement is important. It means that there would have been plastic made, there would have been plastic used, there would have been plastic thrown away and put into landfills and there wasn't. We displaced it with biodegradable, okay, compostable hemp bamboo alternatives. And now we have saved 100, excuse me, 80 tons of plastic, okay, 160 tons of, excuse me, 160,000 pounds of plastic, which equates to 80 tons of plastic we have displaced. And as of today, 55 out of 56 of our products have been transitioned into plastic-free packaging. There are no longer plastic scoops in our packages. We no longer have plastic gift cards that we give out to let people try our product for free. They're now paper or they're virtual, which is even better. And so after having accomplished this for my own company, people came to me and said, you have a tremendous marketing advantage. You're really gonna clean up now because the other companies aren't gonna be as good as you. I said, no, I want every company to be as good as me. And so right Alan on. encouraged me and we have formed what we call the PFPA, the Plastic Free Packaging Alliance. And Alan, I think that brings us up to speed. Um, <laughs> and, and so, yeah, so um, just wanted everybody to get some background as to what brought us to this point that we are now. Yeah, true solutions. And what's great about it is that you're a living example in the industry, hugely successful. So you have that power to influence the other industry people that are in the food business about transitioning, which is what I've been all about, this national transition initiative from fossil fuel based fossil products, uh, petroleum based plastics to these organic renewable, sustainable, compostable. It's just dynamite. I'm so thrilled to be helping you do this alliance. And we're going to reach those companies in your industry and make a big transition happen. So I'm proud to be working with you. By the way, right next to me is someone that, a musician that's coming here to donate their services. And, and play for Earth Day, and he knows you, and he knows your well, company. I know period. about Purium. I use your products, and I recognize your voice. Isn't that cool? Amazing. That well, you thank are? you for that. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's David. Yeah, that's, yeah. Hey, man. Yeah, he's Christ the founder of Purium. Christopher, Christopher Taylor is a friend of mine in Grass Valley, and uh, you know him. He's been to your big of events course. in Mexico and stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah I, I know still use your products. He's a great, great musician. His daughter's yeah. a great cook. Good family, right. good friends. They've been up here to my to uh, my retreat a number of times. Good to see you, man. I recognized your voice. I went. I said, I know that voice. Uh, <laughs> such a well. I have the perfect voice for uh, the perfect face for radio. So that you know, but the voice doesn't hurt either. So, but hey, you know, I just wanted to let people know something really important. You know, just something that is critical, and I want to share this message with you. For so many people, they think, you know, that what I'm doing is to save the earth, to protect Mother Nature. And I want to let you know that that's stupid. Mother Nature does not need me to protect her. Because the 10,000 years it takes for plastic to decompose is the bat of an eyelash for Mother Earth. Okay, the 100,000 years it takes for right. nuclear fuel to decompose is nothing for Mother Earth. I'm trying to save us. I'm trying to save you. I'm trying to save me. I'm trying to save our children, our grandchildren, and our great-grandchildren. I'm trying to save the creatures, the four-legged ones and the winged ones who are suffering because of our polluting of the air, the water, the earth, and ourselves. And if you believe that you don't poop where you eat, okay, well, we've been doing that for far too long. <laughs> and that 
taste in the air and that taste in the water and that smell in the air as well. Well, we know what that is. That's us. So I think it's time we start looking in the mirror and we're looking for the problem. We have to look at us the way I have done so many times and said, you know what? You could do better. Stop being satisfied. Being satisfied is for fools. Okay. Being satisfied is for fools. If you don't believe that there's an urgency to what we do. David, you're. Go ahead. David, your superhero analogy, your superhero analogy makes you at the top of the class and as a true solutionary. I would like to kind of finish this up with you by please letting you talk to other industry people that might be able to hear this and view this during these two days of our Earth Day event. What would you like the industry to do uh, to contact the new alliance, talk to you about your history? I understand that you're also going to make available this breakthrough in your innovation and technology and the way you do your plastic. You're going to make that available so other people can do the transition quicker in their own businesses in the food business. Isn't that correct? Correct. We're going to connect people to the packaging alternatives and to the facilities that can help transition them quickly. Uh, if they need a new packaging partner, if they need to find packaging that's appropriate, we're also going to help them to promote to the public to where the public can find them, see them, support them. We're going to educate both the public and manufacturers as the need to make this transition. We're going to celebrate them with events at music festivals at fundraisers with advertisements and with public service announcements. And we are going to move this needle. We are going to get people to answer the question, you know, are you in business just to improve your market share and your profit margins? Or is there something more to that? Is there something more to that? Could you use that energy of your success? How could you use the energy of your success, of your brilliance, of your innovation, of your strength and power that you've shown us? How could you turn that to be a superpower? You know what I mean? How could everybody have a superpower? So I just want to say thank you. It's been a great forum. Appreciate the opportunity to be heard and encourage everyone to become the solution that you're looking for. Whether it's walking, taking a bike, it's not going on a plane, you know, growing a garden, buying clothes that are used or buying organic. These are all solutionary things. And when one finger is along with 10 other fingers around a table, you could lift the heaviest table with just one finger. And there's a big, big lift that we need to do. But with all of us just pitching in a tiny bit, we could do it. David, I can't thank you enough for joining with us. I want to point out that if anybody is interested in learning more about the Plastic Free Packaging Alliance, you can even contact me at Green to Gold you know, for the two days, and we'll put you in contact with uh, David and this new alliance that's being formed right now. Uh, I can't uh, thank you enough. What is a perfect example of a solutionary superhero you are? Have a good evening and have a happy Earth Day. Thank you, David. Remember, it's not that I'm a superhero. I'm just pointing out that everybody, everybody's a superhero. And you're capable of changing the world, every single person out there. Thank you once again, and blessings to you all. Great, thank you, David. Thank you for your time. And uh, I believe uh, uh, we have Kevin Danaher now uh, on the call. I know he's somewhere high in the Himalayas. No, I think he's high somewhere in the Sierras <laughs> uh, doing a, wildfire management on his property um so uh, uh are you there kevin danaher i do see uh bonnie and i think your camera and your um your camera and your microphone is turned off so we'll get kevin here Let's get there. we're jumping off michael thank you okay thank you elizabeth and soul Great listening to the conversations. We're getting there. Solution, <laughs> solutionaries unite. All over the place. All over the world, yep. Thanks. 
Uh, so while we're waiting for uh, Kevin Danaher to come on, I'm going to I'm going to text him because he did say he was going to be on here a moment ago. Um, so what do you think? All, all of this stuff happening today here. In, this is uh, just the beginning. We've got another day tomorrow. This is just so incredible. And we have a, a bunch of special people coming here tonight that are also solutionaries and helping us and caring about the planet. And we're going to have some entertainment with the indigenous people that are with us tonight. Incredible the way uh, Michael has produced this. And I can't wait for this evening or tomorrow, full day during the day. By the way, we had a wonderful rainstorm. We needed it so badly. California, and it came in last night and it's windy and blue skies and it's cloudy and it's just a beautiful day for Earth Day here. Great, so I'm, I'm gonna uh, go over to, hold on one second before you leave here. Sol, are you there? I am. Great. So I'm going to turn my camera off, uh, turn my camera off a little bit. If you just want to give information for Stand with Amazonia again, and uh, if you can hang out a little bit, we've got some amazing music coming up. We have a, a presentation from our local indigenous women's group, One Drum. Uh, we have a lot more happening, but if you want to talk a little bit, and we're going to switch seats here with, with Professor Alan Trautner, and we'll be back in one moment with Kevin Danaher. So uh, Take it away, Sol Obros, all the way from Tel Aviv, Israel. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yes, well, um, as for Stand with Amazonia, um, it's really a grassroots, grassroots initiative by some concerned citizens around the world, um, just trying to figure out how to amplify the message of the urgency and not let it kind of get um, diluted again uh, before um, we can't turn back. And so um, we have a, a website, but it's it's really volunteer based and it depends on what's going on and um, just how much frontline work we have to be doing in order to update it. Um, I like that you guys talk about solutionaries because I think uh, starting from the indigenous and their um, wisdom uh, and why we need to protect it. I think that was a question you asked me earlier. Um, is really um, up to every one of us. It's in our hands. And um, like Dave said just a minute ago, uh, it really reflects upon the choices that we make. And um, yeah, that's why, as far as I'm concerned, uh, you know, people like Dave go straight on my map and I wanna like uh, be able to also connect them to other people um, where that his solutions that he's coming up with can be relevant, but uh, either way, just um, you know, the good news is that we do have many solutions out there, and uh, more coming, and many more coming, and uh, that's part of the reason why I feel it's an exciting time for. Um, for humanity, but also for people like us who for so long have been almost fighting um, against the current or swimming against the uh, current. And, um, and now it seems like it's kind of uh, turning in our direction uh, where, there's, where it's, it's, there are more people open to it. And funnily enough, I really think that the pandemic helps with that. Um, yeah, I just think it gave people a moment to stop and think, and let's see what the after effect of that is gonna be. Um, but what I really love about this call is actually the fact that it's earth stock, like uh, the um, wood stock of earth day or earth things. Um, and yeah. So it's always really exciting to uh, meet more people who are swimming in the water with us and uh, taking the lead on resolving challenges that we have and solving them. Um, and, I, yeah. and, I love, and I love what you said about earth stock and Woodstock because part of the big thing is, you know, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I wasn't quite a baby boomer. I'm a little younger than that, or at least I hope I look so. 
And uh, the idea was a zeitgeist moment in human history with the human rights movement, civil rights, women's rights, the back to the movement, explosion of arts and culture. It was a whole uh, that was happening uh, worldwide. And a lot of it was around the anti-war movement and civil rights and human rights. But now I, I say that, you know, we have Alan Tratner here, who was uh, one of the co-founders of Earth Day. 52 years later, we have this whole, whole thing of buying cycles of 52 years of putting out uh, the ceremonial fires and starting new fires. So our whole thing right now is we're going from uh, sustainability and community resilience now to regenerate because we not only need solutions uh, to move forward, but we also need to regenerate that which we've destroyed. And on that note, I think uh, I think we have our next guest on the show. Hi from a cave in the Himalayas, or uh, probably the Sierras, possibly. Uh, uh, I want to welcome. Uh, what's that? Quincy. Quincy, uh, I want to welcome our next solutionary luminary. Uh, he is the uh, co-founder of the Green Festival. He's also part of Global Exchange, where they take people all around the world working on issues of human rights and now he's a land steward up in Quincy, Massachusetts, uh, Quincy, California, which is one of the most uh, biologically dynamic areas. I want to welcome to our Earth Day broadcast uh, Dr. Kevin Danaher. So welcome Kevin. Good to see you man. I hope the audio comes through and isn't too shaky jakey because I'm up in the mountains, you know. No, you're good. It sounds great. We're all ears and we're, we were waiting okay. to be uh, amazed by your brilliance. And uh, uh -oh. I, I, I know we could talk on hundreds of topics, but I know you're doing some uh, traditional uh, ecological land management and fire wise practices up there. But maybe just share a little bit, because I know um, we've talked about so many things. I know you were also working on uh, uh, an academy up there. And uh, what is Dr. Kevin Danaher up to these days? Well, uh, lately I've been burning because we're trying to reduce the fuel in the forest. And uh, there's a program, the U.S. Department of Agriculture has a program under its Natural Resource Conservation Service where you get paid $1,000 per acre if you take out your low fuel and make your property more fire safe. And that's something I was going to do anyway. So I'm taking out the low fuel and I'll give you some some scenes. Actually, I'll show you the fire that I've been working on today. We just had a little bit of rain and now the sun's coming out and it's beautiful up here. I can show you like the scenery, beautiful valley. This is Quincy, California, and the county seat of Plumas County. And this is the west side of my property. The west side is the best side. And uh, so we've got ponderosa pine, a lot of oaks over here on the west side, a lot of dug fir, including some young dug fir by the trail here. And you can see the burning that I'm doing, uh, just very safe uh, burn piles to uh, reduce the fuel load. We had to take down some dead trees. These are big big ass dead trees that had to come down and you will notice there's not a lot of branches on them because they've all been burned in this fire so that's that's what i've been doing pretty much every day for the past few weeks i've got an inspection coming up uh next week where the department of agriculture person comes out takes pictures to make sure that I've taken out all the low stuff. You'll notice that there's no branches down low. There's not a lot of ladder fuels taken down a lot of the smaller vegetation and the dead vegetation and uh, getting ready for inspection next week. The idea is to create some nice little camping sites around here. Uh, where people can come and spend time in the forest and just be in the forest. I've set, I've got 10 hammocks set up so far. I got an 11th one ready to go up as soon as I find a good location. And things like uh, we're approaching Big Mama and Big Mama, Big Mama is a huge dug fir. And I cut the, 
the lower branches, the dead branches, so that it make it easy to climb up. And when you get up there in the top of Big Mama, it's a spiritual experience. She's she's amazing. She's been here for a very long time. And uh, so I'm very privileged to be out here in the woods every day, chopping and digging, cutting trails, because uh, when I acquired this property, it didn't have any of these trails. These I, I chopped these and uh, it's a beautiful spot. And you can see the nice view from up here. And we get deer crow, and uh, eagles fly over me almost every day, which is awesome. I, uh, I do want to I, I do want to say, Kevin, can you hear me? Yeah that you know typically on earth day watching a forest burn seems kind of <laughs> antithetical but i want to compliment you because i'm sitting here at a desk uh doing a two-day broadcast by computers technology pushing buttons and you're actually out there on the earth doing it and not only that but you're consciously stewarding uh your land and you're making it more fire tolerant and fire resistant which i know is a huge issue here in california i think we all know just the devastating effects uh, that wildfires have had, uh, and also a lot of the toxic fire retardants. So I just wanted to compliment you on uh, once again walking your talk and and doing this amazing work that you're doing uh, up in Quincy and and creating this center. I think the Japanese call it forest bathing, correct? Where you just kind of yeah. unplug off the grid and you come out there and you get recharged and Shinrin, you get your ions going. Shinrin Yoku forest bathing, and it's just be out in the forest. People don't realize these trees put out pheromones that lower human blood pressure. Just when you're doing carpentry, you gotta watch out, you know, sometimes things get a little weird. Uh, it's an April Fool's joke. Don't what? Oh my God. It's fake. <laughs> I figured I'd throw a little humor <laughs> in this issue here. But we, we need some humor and shock of that. You can't just be all talking heads on Earth Day today, so. Well, dude, I'm old enough that I remember the first Earth Day. I remember in the late 60s, there was so much uh, like mobilization, mass mobilization. You had Silent Spring, the book come out. There was uh, the Cuyahoga River caught on fire. There was all this crazy stuff. And there was enough mass mobilization to force Richard Nixon, right wing Republican Richard Nixon, to pass the EPA, the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act. All of this great legislation that we rely on now came out of that period of late 60s, early 70s. I, I, I personally think that Woodstock in August 1969, because I was there, I think that had something to do with it. Half a million people realizing, hey, we're, we're a movement now. Look at this. There's half a million of us hanging out and not killing each other and being nice and sharing food and stuff. So it was a period, late 60s, early 70s, it was a period where people got off the couch and got out and demanded change from our quote unquote leaders and things got changed, laws got passed, you know, very, very important period. Can you still hear me? And, and, I, and I want to add to that. Absolutely. And we're kind of at that zeitgeist moment. Yep. And I, and I want to just say, you know, we're also at that zeitgeist moment right now. I know an event called Regenesis out in Crestone, Colorado. We're talking a lot about a lot of the Hopi teachings, Hopi indigenous prophecies. And a big part of it is what the crossroads There's no gray area right now. We either choose self-preservation or self-destruction. And yeah. we are the ones and now is the time to do it. So um, I, I, I want to thank you. We have a few more minutes with you. I also want to introduce, I'm not sure if you've ever met uh, Professor Alan Tratner. We did a festival with Mark and Nina Merson. Nice. Good you to remember see. that we were the ones that did the EcoX, the National Marketplace EcoExpo all during the 90s in the Green yeah. Business Conference. Yeah, so very you allowed me to speak and exhibit at your, your LA event. Yeah, it was a very similar idea. Oh, behind I'm, a, I'm a around environmental royalty today. <laughs> There's a green economy happening out there. 
the corporate media are not going to tell us about it. The corporate media is not going to give us a critique of capitalism. They get their money by selling our brains to the corporate advertisers to get us to think that life is about acquiring stuff instead of about relationships with other living things. So we have to do that ourselves. And that's why the explosion of Instagram and TikTok and Facebook and all these other social media, where if you look at the history of communication, it was first, it was one to one. Then with radio and TV, it was one to many. Now with the internet, it's many to many where everybody can connect with everybody else. And that's a democratizing force that puts people like Vladimir Putin on a hot seat of trying to run a dictatorship. It doesn't work anymore because the information is out there. The videos of the destruction and the damage they're doing is out there. So we're living in a great period of potential change. Absolutely. And it's really interesting. Saying, I know you're a busy guy, but in just a few uh, moments, we're going to have uh, Richard uh, Saline on, on the uh, Zoom call on the broadcast today. And Richard's doing amazing work. He's the founder of the Resilience Innovation Hub uh, for the uh, insurance industry. And he is doing, again, another solutionary. I have to say, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a pretty busy guy, but I'm really humbled today by all the people that are coming on this two-day broadcast. All doing. And we decided not to do a huge publicly facing because we're trying to, what we say, round up the lions at the round table. Um, instead of cat herding and just trying to preach to the choir or doing another celebration, we're really getting uh, all the key players uh, on a global level uh, together. I know we just had a Sola Brosa on from Tel Aviv, Israel, who's doing the Stand of the Amazonia project. Uh, we also have uh, Rachel and Greg here, uh, and we're working uh, with them in collaboration with Microsoft. And we're actually doing a whole virtual world broadcast of the event today, reaching into many of the different communities that are on uh, digital platforms and of course, streaming on social media. So uh, really feel really honored to be here today. We're gonna go over to Richard in just a moment here. And thank you for your patience, Richard. Um, but I just wanna give uh, uh, Dr. Kevin Danaher a few more moments to share any uh, words of wisdom. I know you and I have talked in the past and we can go on for hours, but. Uh, you know, in this time, because part of the theme of Earth Day this year is take action, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, the information's out there. So what are some things? How can we inspire people from the, uh, the, words, the words of the founder, co-founder of Green Festival? What can people do, um, you know, whether they're a householder or they're advocate and activist, a land steward, what can people do right now? How can we inspire people to, you know, throw their hat in the ring and get involved? I would say the biggest thing to be cautious of and watch out for is the cult of powerlessness. I hear in day-to-day -day conversation, a lot of people who are making excuses for inaction saying, oh, it's always been this way. Oh, the elites, they control everything. Capital logic school, capitalism will just incorporate any, that's BS. Don't let yourself get sucked into that negativity. We have to have the consciousness of the Masons who laid the foundation layer of those huge cathedrals in Europe that took centuries to build, uh, Prague. The, the, the cathedral took 400 years to build. The Masons who laid the foundation layer, they knew they would not see the final product of their work. We will not be alive to see the final product of all of this green economy, sustainability, regenerative agriculture, all this work, we're laying the foundation for future generations to build on top of what we have laid down. And we need to take heart from that, get behind the youth that are out there. The youth are going to lead the movement. And us oldsters who screwed up the planet, we need to get behind the youth and support them in every way we can. Get some youth mentors that you hang out with and get wisdom from and follow them and support them. Great. Not... Thank you. Thank you, Kevin, uh, Dr. Kevin Dan, her words of wisdom. And I look to I look forward to visiting you. I know you were talking about creating a resilience hub there in Quincy and you had a whole blueprint. We've talked about several things. 
I want to stay in touch with you about that because right now we just got offered 3,000 acres in Costa Rica to do a, a, a academy. Uh, I'm working with people now in Nevada City who just pioneered 100 acre property to do a whole sustainable community and resilient center. And I'm also working with people in Mount Shasta. And as you know, I've been out in Crestone, Colorado, working on acquiring 40 acres there. So, yeah. you know, having these uh, Jedi academies of community <laughs> sustainability and resilience and regenerative culture to educate people and get these curriculums and start empowering people, especially in areas that are pertinent to uh, the importance of food and water security. And I've seen, I think we've seen a lot of that over the last couple of years with uh, supply chain issues and our dependency on a system that seems to be changing rapidly and kind of uh, uh, falling apart. So again, uh, you know, empowering each other, empowering our communities, taking responsibility for our sovereignty and the way that we work in our communities is such a key time. So we'll be talking more about these land-based um, academies and resilience hubs. And I think with that, it parlays perfect into our next uh, guest. So I'm going to let uh, uh, Professor Alan Chatner introduce him. But again, thank you so much for your time. And it's it's nice someone is out enjoying the earth today on Earth Day, <laughs> and we're sitting here in Ventura um, getting it done with the technology piece. So thank you so much. Hey, and Michael. Michael, yep. don't let Kevin go yet. I need his address so I can jump on a plane or ride my bicycle <laughs> and hang out with him. I'm sitting in Houston, Texas. It's, oh, okay. it's Kevin, it's 80 damn degrees. The allergy season is off the charts. And I just want to come out and hang out with you. Okay. All right. So, I'm up. I'll be here. You know, keep the fire burning, please. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Keep the fire burning. <laughs> All right, with that, we're going to turn over to Professor Alan Chatner and our, our next speaker, David. Thank you so much for your time, Kevin. And Bye, Kevin. Thanks, Sol, for hanging in there from Tel Aviv. It's going to get fun here in a few minutes. Great to see you again, Kevin. Bye bye. Yeah, okay, yeah. Richard, thank you for being with us a couple hours later where you are. But again, and this well, thank is the you. This, uh, Michael. Michael, I got a question. Yep. We're not getting Kevin still with us. Uh, yeah, but it's um, okay. Hold on. hold on for one second. Due to technical difficulties. Okay. Yeah, okay, great. Speaker. Okay. There we Perfect. Go. Speaker view. Thank, Thank you, you, Michael. Yep. All right, Richard. Hi. Nice to see you again. <laughs> to see. Richard, Listen, I so thought you were putting my cutting in. Thought you were putting Michael on because no, he was gonna. No, no, he was gonna cut some of uh, his. That Michael was going to cut some of his hair and send it to me uh, and, and, in honor and of send Earth it to Day. you. Yeah, and send you to, send it to you. So it would be an exchange of locks here. Exactly. Okay, so here we go, Richard. Um, I want to let everybody know that's watching around the world. I met Richard through one of our actual uh, keynote speakers that's coming on this evening, and that is Sergio who is with the UN SDGs and the Pope's uh, climate project and his donor fund and uh, public uh, is his company that he works on all these different levels. And he told Richard about myself and Green to Gold and our incubator and our accelerator. And that's how we got connected. Then as we progress, and I want you to tell about how you built this incredible hub that's not only national with all its nodes that you always use, uh, but it's also international and how we got to the point that you adopted uh, this transition project that I've been doing since the 50th birthday of, of, uh, of Earth Day. So what happened is that we had this discussion about what we could do in really making industry become more sustainable and resilient. And then Richard told me about this incredible resilience innovation hub that we're going to about to talk about. Also, he has a background in being in the federal government. Isn't that right, Richard? And in working in government and working in industry as an entrepreneur. So here's a guy that's done it all. And, and you also told me that you actually orchestrated one of the presidential inaugurations. I and mean, when you think about this kind of experience, it's incredible. So what I'm pleased to hear tonight and it's about, or today or wherever you are in the world, is, um, is how you came to invent this innovation of the Resilience Innovation Hub, what it means, what the mission is, and how you came to adopt uh, our transition project that we're doing from green to gold. 
Well, Alan, thank you uh, for your invite. Um, thank you for your uh, phenomenal spirit of, uh, of focusing very specific on an issue. I think that um, uh, sad but true is no different than where we all were in the 70s. Um, you know, we, we make progress. We take a few steps back. We make a few, you know, few more steps forward. Let me, um, I, I'm going to start, Alan, with something that you and I talked a little bit about before. Um, so I was raised with uh, a certain amount of mentoring by a lot of, fortunately, a lot of business and political and civic leaders. But, you know, the one thing every one of those folks said to me, Alan, is my responsibility is to leave the world better than how I found it. That has never changed from the first time that I heard that, right? You're spoke, you know, pick up a piece of trash, even if it's not your piece of trash, you know, clean something up, make it better, improve it better than it was. Well, so let me make the connection to that little observation to where we are today. So fast forward, I live in Houston, Texas, which has a lot of uh, ties, uh, some good, some bad, to Earth Day. This is an area that's lost hundreds of billions of dollars. Sad, but again, true, you know, loss of life, loss of assets, loss of operations because of a series of hurricanes, floods, storms, fires, spills, leaks, you name it. So when you live in a community like Houston, which I just moved back to after 40 years of being up on the East Coast, um, it became very clear, Alan, that economically, people cannot sustain this continuous loss. They can't, there's just no amount of money that you can print to sustain the ability to operate this way. And I started asking a lot of stupid questions, Alan, as you know, I get to ask a lot of stupid questions. One of which is a very simple, stupid question. Why? Why do we keep on doing this, right? After you've lost billions and trillions of dollars. Um, so I moved back to Texas, Alan, and I start. My original focus, what brought me here and home, was um, because the state of Texas 10 years ago went into the drought of record. It was before California. As you know, California went into a drought right after Texas. Um, state, I mean, cities were running out of water, Alan. Cities literally had to shut down their operations. Companies, communities had no water, right? Um, that was the first sign. And so when I moved back here, I kept on saying, you know, what, why, how do we get to this point? How, how do we, oddly enough, in this very successful state, um, get to this point? Well, the first thing I was told was I couldn't mention the word, Alan, I can't mention the word climate change. Richard, don't oh, you can, don't talk about climate, Alan. <laughs> you know, Richard, you lived up on the East Coast too long. You've been hanging out with Al Gore. And I said, well, wait a second. Okay, let's not talk about climate change. Let's just not even talk about it. Let's talk about why after literally 50 years of no drought, boom, Alan, we had a drought. And it wasn't one year, wasn't two five-year drought, Alan. It didn't go away, all right? And then, Alan, at the end of the drought, boom, 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 hurricane, storm, flood, hurricane, storm, flood. And I said, wait a minute. I understand y'all don't want to talk about climate. I got that. But let's talk about how tropical storms, Alan, that were like, you know, there was a tropical storm on a Monday at 8 o'clock, Eight o'clock on Tuesday, that tropical storm became a hurricane level three. Tropical storm within 24 hours became a very harsh hurricane. 
And so I started asking a lot of the business community and a lot of the civic leaders, the intensity of these storms, the intensity of the climate, something's going on. And they said to me, Richard, you know, we're recognizing that there is an ongoing challenge, right? So let's be really, really honest, Alan. I can't talk about, I'm saying it tongue in cheek, I can't talk about climate. But what I can talk about is the economic consequences of what it's doing to the society, to the businesses, to the, you know, the communities that we're in, right? So right. let me make the connection here. So I go back up to Washington and I asked a couple of questions. Why? Why do we keep on putting federal funding, insurance funding, insur you know, federal dollars to having people just build to what they had before the loss? Why were we not in investing in helping people invest in different kinds of materials? Or more importantly, Alan, why were we giving people money to build right where the failures were, right where, you know, flooding and all? So at that point, was there were a lot of other people asking that question. So now FEMA sets aside, it's going to actually approach about 12%, which may not sound like a lot of money. Alan, that's a lot of money. They're going to set aside, and they've already begun, what they what's called BRIC, and it's money to allow and fund projects that are resilient, sustainable, green infrastructure, right? Into in a sense, build back better as as this administration. Okay, that was one thing. The second question I asked, I went and talked with the insurance and reinsurance companies, Alan. I said, You've lost trillions of dollars. I mean. And, and part of the reason why they lost trillions of dollars is because people kind of go, okay, I got insurance. So Alan, I can act as crazy as I want, right? I, I don't have to have any responsibility, no accountability, something that Kevin was kind of hinting at a little bit earlier, right? So insurance is a wonderful product to have. Everybody literally should have flood insurance if they're in the wrong area. Everybody should have insurance. But it doesn't give you a pass to be irresponsible, unaccountable for. It, it doesn't. My son had a wreck. God love him. Had a wreck. Thankfully, it wasn't his fault. Thankfully, you know, he, he wasn't hurt. But his comment was, hey, dad, we got insurance. I said, uh, 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 no, no, no. That doesn't mean that you are excused from, you know, being responsible. Okay. So let me take the next part. Adding these pieces up, Alan, I started asking again, um, if we can't sustain where we are, we can't afford to keep on doing what we're doing. All right. Um, and then two other things happened, Alan. Two other things happened. The data science caught up with everything, Alan, that you and I and others are talking about now. The, da you know, the data science. Now, there are people, Alan, you and I both know, who are going to argue about science. All right? And they're, they're, I, can't, I can't help them, okay? If they think that they're going to sail on a boat and it's going to go to the edge and there's a dragon at the end of the of the edge and they're going to fall off i'm sorry Alan. the, the I'm, flat earthers yes well I, I i i think they're a little bit more flatter than earther but <laughs> um but alan so the data science is is irrefutable and now you can take a look at these areas of the country around, around the world for your international we now know what's happening, what has happened. And we now can use a lot of data to look out and project in the future. And the, the consequences of what we're looking at can either be the abyss or the horizon, the abyss or the horizon, all right? So Alan, I decided that after looking at water, water technology, water, you know, the, the data science, the investing community, I wanted to do a pivot. 
And I also wanted to do a pivot because I mentioned our son. I think it's my responsibility to leave this place a lot better than I got it. But then I got it bad, but that's my responsibility to hand the next generation something good, something better and improved. If it's less than what I got it, Alan, I failed, right? So we formed what's called the Resilience Innovation Hub. The headquarters is here in Houston, and I'll come back to that in a second. Um, we have nodes in Boston, New York, Chicago, Norfolk, Virginia, Atlanta, uh, New Orleans, San Juan, Puerto Rico, Silicon Valley, uh, greater what I call California, Oregon, because of the fires. Um, you know, we're forming relationships with others, you know, around the world, including the Midwest, including the Midwest. Right. Because, the, you know, I talked to two Great different lady. governors, Alan, one Republican, one Democrat in Iowa, for, two former governors of Iowa. And they said, Richard, I, you know, y'all get the hurricanes down there on the coast. But Iowa and, you know, Nebraska and, and Alan, they, they flood more often than we do. All right. So bottom line is for a long winded answer to a very short question, it's, it became apparent that what we needed to do was take technology, equipment, data science and alternative capital and change this conversation about risk, change the conversation about risk, which is what you, Alan, have been talking about. That if we didn't put ourselves forward to change the relationship with the earth, with the planet that we're dealing with, it was gonna continue to be increasingly risky. Well, Alan, I'm sorry, in the 70s, you rang the bell along with a lot of other people about what the risk we're looking at. Here's what's happened, Alan. The lines have crossed. You know, the, the lines have crossed. The risk have now reached a level that it's gotten the attention of enough people, including, Alan, enough people with resources. And I know not everybody loves their insurance company. And trust me, I am not here as a stalking horse for the insurance companies. But they have money. They have what I call the carrot and stick, Alan. All right, they got the stick, raise rates, leave markets, do whatever. But they also have trillions of dollars of capital to put behind the transition, the adaptation economy, the resilience economy. That's one. Number two is federal government's got a ton of money that they now have available. All right. All of the, the legislation that's passed, that's again, trillions of dollars. And in Allen, there's 12 to 14, and this is a conservative number, 12 to 14 trillion dollars of generational wealth that's going to be changing hands. So right. it's not the money, Alan. It's not the money. It's can we make these connections like you and others are so good at that we take individuals, get the resources, the technology, and it doesn't have to be high tech either, by the way. All right. The innovation. So that's what the innovation hub is about, is to connect the dots and change the future of risk at a hyper local level and at a global level. Hey, Richard, I got a question for you. That was just perfect to, to weave that whole story. Are you outside in, in very heavy Texas wind? Am I, are you getting a lot of feedback? Yeah, we're getting, it sounds like wind noise all over yeah. the place. Sorry, let me go. I was going to enjoy the outdoors. Although, Alan, here, I'll show you one little view from our new place in Houston. <laughs> you see all those lights way out in the distance? You see all those yep. lights way out in the distance? Yes. All right, just for your viewers? <laughs> that is all of the petrochemical and chemical facilities. Okay. Oh, sure. I mean, way, you're, way, you're, you're fossil your fossil fuel country. Are you kidding? Oh, oh um, but this is even by better. By the way, how, how close are the fires to you? They're not. Our, they're, they're, they're really to uh, the far, kind of out to the west of us. But Alan, let, let, let me let me share something. Sorry uh, about the wind, but let me share something. Um, today, a major 
top 100 company in the oil and gas and petrochemical business announced the permanent closure of their chemical plant. And I'm raising that because Alan, while Texas and specifically Houston have been built on oil and gas and cattle and cotton and all of these other things, all right, this now has become um, almost ground zero um, for the energy transition economy. You've got, you know, beautiful. You've got, yeah, great. You know, the the top fifty, Fortune fifty energy chemical company headquarters or operations. And Alan, guess who's funding, you know, part of the transition, solar, wind, battery, um, you know, now is it going to happen overnight, Alan? No, it's not. Okay. But your reason why I wanted to share that with you is on earth day, on the very earth day, one of the companies, Lion Dell, that's a good Ryan Dell announced that they're closing their plan, partly because of the economics, but partly because they see the future. And guess where they're going to put all their money? Guess where they're going to put all their money, Alan? Right. Alternative energy. It better be in renewable energy. You got it. What a perfect, perfect solution that you put together there. I'm proud to be involved in that. You just came off doing this incredible international uh, investment for for the industry with uh, I was participating in it and and yep. a lot of other people that were part of your nodes and everything and experts from government and you even had uh, people that were involved in in the investing side and yep. public public private uh, partnerships it was an incredible incredible archive of well, thank you exactly thank you. what you're trying to do and right. and I'm so thrilled that you adopted our uh, national transition initiative that yep. Green to Gold was trying to push to the world is move from where you are in a transition that doesn't disrupt your employment and your economics to the green economy, the inclusive right. global green yeah. economy. And, and I'm so thrilled. Well, that Alan, you look, could tell, you're, tell everybody yeah, about this. Alan, now I get, Alan, I get to tell, this is, Alan, this is just you and me, right? There's nobody else yeah, on right. this conversation. Right? On a, on a, Right on a global stream, now, just you and me. On this, just you and me. Okay. Send send, send a post yeah, it. Okay, yeah. Al, <laughs> Alan. I had a conversation with the um, with the senior counselor for the secretary of the Department of Homeland Security today. Alan, this don't tell anybody, Alan. Okay, I had right. this conversation. All right, and we were talking, Alan, about the transition, the initiative. All right. And how what we have been putting together, right, is this connection again of technology, equipment, data science, and alternative capital driven by this issue of climate and resilience, right? Well, Homeland Security has got a lot of issues that they have to deal with, okay? Lots of issues that you, you know, you can imagine, all right? Yeah, including the, responding, responding to all those disasters that are climate-driven that we're Correct. talking about. Yep. And, and it is listed no longer as an economic threat. It's a national security threat. See, that's okay. great adoption. Yeah. So, so um, I wanted to share with you, you know, is that part of why the innovation investor forum that we just concluded and thankful to, to you for participating for, you know, 14, sessions would have been a lot easier alan to do two days 250 people in a ballroom and been done with it but you know february march and april we did 14 sessions um but what's interesting alan i and again you know we i can share openly about this and michael may find this interesting our our kickoff our kickoff panel the first speaker that we had all right is a part of the Urban Land Institute, which is the major developers from around the world who have adopted- I remember it well. Right, Alan, who have adopted adaptation, sustainability, green, climate, all right, 
at, you know, as a baseline now for the realization that they can't, some of them, not all of them, but some of the developers just need to stop building where they're building. It's foolish. Okay. And so yes, right. we kicked off on that. All right. And that set the tone for the connection between the national transition initiative, adaptation, sustainability, and all. But Alan, you may recall that our second session was with Howard W. Buffett, all right? Warren Buffett's grandson, who basically has come up now with an algorithm and a way to measure connecting traditional investing, social impact investing, and green sustainable investing to the point where the wealthiest families around the world now are connecting the dots on how their investing is actually going to change the performance along the lines of what you and Michael and others are interested in seeing, right? But they're also going into the boardrooms and to the shareholders saying that, look, you know, you can, you can make money being green. You can make money being <laughs> responsible. You can make money, right, doing the right thing. So um, that's really, Alan, I think what I'm hoping your listeners and, and those celebrating Earth Day is, we, first off, we got to stop talking about everybody's a boogeyman who doesn't completely 100% agree with us. I, I'm saying that out of, out of well, true... I, well, I... I will say, yes, Michael. I will say this, Richard. Our our future looks so bright. I have to put sunglasses on. You know, you know what? You're doing that and, because uh, hey, so, hey, 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 you're doing that because I, just, I didn't powder my wig, Michael. Okay, so that uh, 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 that just hurt. Okay. The reflection off the yes. the, the original Tesla solar panel. Yeah, be, be careful. <laughs> He's looking to your hair with envy, hey. right? Okay. No. So, so I will only, say this: we have people starting. I will say this, we have another moment left. People are starting to arrive and, and we need to, Alan to be a, a host now for people. And we got some music coming up in a minute. They've been I, I heard, meeting. I heard, but so, listen, um, thank y'all so much for letting me do this. Michael and Alan, I, 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 I'm blown away by what y'all put together. Um, it, it, the, the, my big, big takeaway, Michael and Alan is this, all right? Um, we, we hear too much about all the bad stuff that's going on, about where social media, and trust me, uh, I'm beginning to get less enamored by certain parts of social media and all. But when these tools are in the hands of people seeking to do something phenomenal, whether it's connecting ideas, connecting technology, connecting capital, the bottom line is, y'all know better than I do, is we need to celebrate a lot of great things that we just don't take time to do. Um, and I don't care about good media, bad media. I care about that good people can do a lot of damn good, unfettered if we unleash innovation. And Alan, thank you for being, you know, uh, I mean, you don't have to do this, Alan. You could be retired sitting out and, you know. Well, we, we donned him the green knight. Yeah. So he, he's our he's our green champion yeah, here, right. the green wizard. Yeah. I think I saw that movie. But listen, y'all go enjoy the evening. I'm sorry that I can't be out there with you and, and um, having a glass of wine or whatever, Michael, and listening to some music. Saul, I'm sorry that I, I don't even know if where in Israel are you. Where is Israel? <laughs> I really, I'm uh, Tel Aviv, Israel. One um, of my favorite places in the world. But listen. Uh, we, we stand ready through the innovation hub and the network throughout the country. We stand ready to leverage this idea of these resilient zones, which are really ways to go in at a hyper local level and start applying things. So the good right. news. Well, another solutionary comes on our Earth Day broadcast. Thank you, Richard, so much. Thank you. Everybody Have stay a good safe. Good evening. And I'll Great. talk to you next week. Great. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Okay. Bye bye. Richard. So we got some live music coming right now uh, with uh, Billy Bensing and friend.
Brian Lambert. Brian Lambert. Great. Uh, they have a great mix of some music for y'all to enjoy. Yeah. And uh, we're just we're just keeping it going. So I'm gonna I'm gonna tactfully move over to the other side of the room. Okay. So we need a stand we can use. Okay, we'll get one here. Where'd Billy go? song and uh, I'm just kind of learning it and we're going to do it with Bluetooth but it's not another way to hook it up here so here we go Wave your hands, wave, wave your hand, Billy, wave your hand above your head for a minute. Okay, I just want to make sure I got you. Okay, it's all you guys.
little bit too loud. If we bring it down to here, we won't get distortion. Okay. Got it. Okay. Okay. Uh, that or or the or here. Let's do it here. Okay.
Yes. Okay. We're so going it's, we're going to go on the road as floating on the sea of spirit collective. <laughs> <laughs> what is the anachronism for that? Floating O T. Keep going. Floating on the fox. The F O T. Floating on the C S fox of foxo. <laughs> it's fat, fat so we ain't gonna make it. Okay. It's fat so. Let us go to the land of fat so. We used to play this stuff uh, years ago. We, we played around LA for like five years. And we haven't played together in what, 30 years. years. Wow. So we're, we're just re reamping some Bensing and Lambert music. Yeah. I'm Bensing and he's Lambert. I wish you could, I need a mirror so I can see you. Yeah, I'll, I'll just, I'll just turn I'll it just, off. Use, your, use your spiritual eyes. Oh, okay. Right, right, right. right. He's floating on the sea of spirit. Right, right, that's right. Now we're going to do a song called Am I Alone? This is a three part harmony song. This was my mid 20s crisis song. It's kind of like a song about being alone and wanting to be loved. And, Anyway, and I created all the tracks in the background, so uh, those go like this. Oh, 
songs with me and then she's going to do a little show of her own and she's a friend of mine. A visitation. And here's a really cool song. Uh, can we play? We're playing a few more. I'm getting... Yeah, yeah, hold on. I got it. We're getting too hot. So this is, this, this is the uh, story to this song. This, this song was about a dream that I had when I was a teenager. Uh, when I was very young in New York, I kind of was running with gangs in New York, you know, a lot of tough guys. But something happened in New York in New York uh, in the uh, 60s when Eastern mysticism hit the shores of New York very powerfully. And so in the hippie kingdom, there became a split between the ones that stayed in that world and the ones that went to mysticism and went to yoga and went to food, good food, all that kind of stuff. So, but it was difficult for me because I was starting to have these spiritual experiences and my friends were making fun of me, my, my good friends. And so I, as a young boy, I was very alienated. And then I had a dream. Um, uh, so what happened on this dream was the friend that was putting me down for a spiritual points of view, he was in this dream and I was on this planet that was made of green marble. It was just, it was the size of earth, but it was all green and flat and marble. And the only thing on it were these two white Grecian pillars that had, there were six white alabaster steps with two Grecian pillars that were uh, formed at the top. And then between the two pillars, I saw the sunrise very quickly, very fast, and went and went right into the middle of the sky. And in front of the, in front of the, the sun, these multicolored clouds started flittering back and forth. And I looked up at the sun, and my friend Mike, Michael was there. And I said, look, Michael, there's, there's spirit. There is the supreme being. There's God. And he laughed at me, just like he did in real life. And then all of a sudden, the sun turned into two hands, two prayer hands in the sky. And I looked up at it. It sounds like the song. It is the song. It's on the whole story already. And all right. So, so the hands came down and enveloped me, and I felt energy hitting back back and forth in my body and i woke up and from that point forward i left that 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 whole gang of kids that i was that i knew and i met this other friend who was also on the same uh, journey as me and we so this this dream called visitations from the sun gave me the power to change my life and i'm going to have billy sing it i'll sing a middle part because i haven't done it in quite a while but he loves it a lot so I yeah, I love the song. I'll try to do it justice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. All right, all right. Here we go. Hopefully, I, mean, I won't mess the words. Here we go. Are oh, you ready? All right. Actually, I did this with Michael live for the. Uh, you were playing hand drums, Michael, on this song. Remember? Yeah. <laughs> Shine, 
Well, this is a different version. That was fun, Brian. We haven't played that in ages. How did you feel? Was that fun? The uh, first performance? And for the timing. The timing? Uh, yeah, we, we, you know, we need to kind of get it back. Okay, this song. Uh, all right, I, I wrote this when I was about um, 18 years old, and I was living in, I was living in Paris, France, France, you know Paris, and um, and I was upset because the great, the great, um, um, I was very young, I was 18, years, and the Great Lakes were dead. So I thought, how stupid can people be to pollute the Great Lakes so bad that they're that all the fish died in the lakes? So I went, well, if we can do that to biggest lakes in the world, then we might be able to, uh, what about the ocean? Is that next? So I kind of got, the song kind of like was a download to me. I felt like God gave me the song. It's called Old Mother Sea. It's been in three movies now, two Australian movies. One of the movies was, the whole soundtrack was done by Pink Floyd, and then they got my song in it. So I felt really proud to have a song with, uh, with Pink Floyd. You know, I'm too cool now, you know, so anyway. But um, this is a new version of it, and I'm going to play it for you. And Oh yeah, well I want to marry a Grammy with Mary Youngblood, but it wasn't this song. It, you know, Mary Youngblood was a Native American, amazing flute player. She's like the best. And uh, I wrote a song on her on her on her one of her CDs, and that won the Grammy for her. And so I'm, I got a feather in my cap. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, let me play Old Mother Sea, and uh, I got my my ear. I'm listening to the ball game. I'm just kidding. all right. <laughs> Well, I gotta find it. Hold I, I did all the music in the best for it. Where is it? It's um, ah, uh, for two. Uh, I'm gonna grab a pick in the middle of the song. Anyway, it goes like this. She said, 
Taking so much from the old years Giving you much of your love Now something's happening I feel slacking in love My greatest crime Goody, everybody. Yeah. Come on now, let's do it. All right, this is about gold country, and uh, you guys look so beautiful out there, all you, all you gals. And most of the gals look great, I think. You know. <laughs> yeah. All right, here's a here's a song y'all know, so. Along or whatever, then, then we're going to have some other stuff going
kind of move. And anyway, we're going to have a, the, um, well, the, the short break and then one drum's going to present our opening. Speech. All right, we're going to have a short break and then one drum. Uh, 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 yeah. <laughs> like Michael said, right? okay, would it be Bach? Would it be Bach? Here, you know, it's nice to have an audience kind of. All right, rock on. All right. You know what you got to do for me? You got to take Neil Young's song. Make it so three, two, five. That's good. That's <laughs> and I'm not going to get old. Yeah, I won't get old. We're not going to get old. We're not going to get old. Should I turn my speakers off for a minute? Yeah. It's just to save the battery because they're. Absolutely. Oh, 
We are one drum. We are a group of indigenous sisters and women and mothers and daughters and aunties that gather around the ceremonial drum for the sole purpose of singing our prayers, healing our hearts, healing ourselves, and healing our community. We're intertribal, which means that we share in each other's way and each other's tradition and each other's customs. And the more that we do that, the understanding, the respect that we step into and honor of each other's way brings us closer to our mother. When I see myself in my sister, I am my sister. And we are one. We are taught as indigenous people that there's no I, it is we that is us, that is our. And we are also taught that we walk upon our mother gently and we do no harm. So for us as women, we gather around the drum to sing prayers for the water, for the air, for the earth, for everything that is because we are everything that is. We are because it is. Yes. And so when we take in that breath, we become and we take in everything that is. And when we exhale, we become one with everything that is. So we honor that and we know that, we respect that, we hold that in our heart. If the water's sick, we are sick because we are water. So this is where we gather, we come together, we pray together to bring healing for our mother. So it is time that we remember we are one people. Yeah. And together we can shift. Together we can bring change, but it has to be together. And what we are trying to do as one drum is open the door to start having those conversations, those conversations that are open for dialogue, for healing, for understanding, so that you and I can see each other yeah. within each other. The drum was not gifted just to the indigenous, the native, it was gifted to all peoples for the sole purpose of remembering 
that we all carry that one pulse, the heartbeat, the universal heartbeat that we all walk with, that we all dance with, that we forget at times. So pulse, that is why it's given to all people, the drum. And it echoes when you hit the drum, it sends out that prayer and it brings that prayer back so it's a complete circle. It echoes because it's sending out a prayer and then you're receiving a prayer. And that is why the drum is so sacred for all cultures. So they can remember to remember, as my grandfather taught me, remember to remember who you are. Remember that you are sacred. Remember that you are holy. Remember that you are here to do and to be and to serve your people and see yourself in others. And when you do the work and you raise that sacred smoke, which we have done, since we started this live feed, we have raised our sacred smoke and we have sent it to each and every one of you. We raise sacred smoke for each and every one of you that your prayers are heard and felt and together we can make that shift Amen. for humanity and we can make this a change together. Thank you for including the indigenous people. Thank you for acknowledging our presence that we are here to serve. And please ask questions. Please. Let's get to know each other. Because after this, when we sing you our prayers, we are family, because we have been in ceremony together. So for this day forward, we are family. We are one. And this moment will never be the same ever again. So if you would allow us to take you on a journey through the medicine wheel, which holds everything that is, and everything that is the universe, that medicine wheel is represented. So we're going to take you through the wing and the crawlers and the swimmers, the flyers, and we're going to bring you through the fire. We're going to take you to the earth. So if you just allow us to take you on that journey and to keep an open heart and receive the medicine, I know when we walk out of here, when this event continues, because it's an ongoing journey for us to take care of our mother, mm. that we will be new people um, and that we will be connected from this day forward, now and always. Relations in my language, truth has been spoken. Let's start with the strong woman song. And um, who's one? Who's two? Who's three? Who's four? Five, they all sing it together. I know. 
the next prayer that we will do for you is a, a fire song that was taught to me by my brother. But one of our elders who has walked on asked us sisters to sing this song for the men. He says, sisters, please sing this song for the men. He's one of our Lakota brothers. His name is Sunny, and he asked us to sing this prayer for the men. He says, for the men have lost their way. And they have to remember that fire, that light that is within them, that heart. Sing it with everything that you have for the men so that they can come into that remembrance. And we can walk together, and we can be one bird with equal wings to fly so that we can reach the apex and we can come into that understanding of who we are as men and who you are and that we are equal. And so I sing this fire song and I ask of you men to bring in all the men and your family and your daughters and your mothers and your ancestors because we are one people. And you may not know this prayer, but believe me, it knows you. It knows you because we all carry that universal fire, that light that is all of us. So we're going to slow it down a little. And we will handle that fire so that we come into that remembrance of that light that is within us, that grace. Water sick, we're sick because we are water. So we're going to take you to the water, and if it feels right, we'll clean up. Maybe for a moment, surrender and let go. And if it's, it's I'm laughing because my my elder, my grandfather, tells me, daughter, 
If your stuff is that important to you, then you can pick it up on the way out. <laughs> but while you're here with me, surrender everything. Hold on to it that high. So I have to say those words. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm laughing because I'm thinking of him at this moment. <laughs> so we're going to take you to the ocean. It's an Ohlone song, which we will be there tomorrow for the first time ever one drum. And women, I mean, and you don't know, but traditionally women don't gather around a big drum. They don't gather around the ceremonial drum. It's something that the men have always done. And creator asked of me that it was time to gather the women around the ceremonial drum so that we can heal our hearts. And I can look across and touch knees with my sister. And I can look in my sister's eyes and see myself. And I could do some healing. So that way I heal myself. I heal my children. And I heal my mother, my auntie, my ancestors and the men in our life. So this song and this prayer that we're going to, it's an Ohlone, which they're gonna have, uh, anybody who are available, they will, they're having their big, their 28th annual uh, big time powwow and gathering. On Saturday, we'll have a bear dance, which is unusual that it's open to the public because it's something that we do as people only within our community and within on the reservation with, with our peoples. That's how we heal our people. And it's open to the public, and it is tomorrow in Pomona, California. It's um, something that if anybody has the time, please start at dark thirty. And what I mean is sundown. They call it dark thirty, but sundown. And um, one drum. They asked us sisters to be a part of the powwow, which is a great honor. We come in humility because, as I said, women traditionally aren't on the ceremonial drum, but it is now time to share that medicine because the women need healing. Mm -hmm. The women need healing. And this is why we gather around the ceremonial jump to do that. So here we go. We're going to sing you and take you to the water that ever flows for life as well. And I thank you, our lonely brothers and sisters, for this good medicine. Oh,
have a group code with yourself with all those around you. The remembrance of the love within is to score high and not be, not be afraid to come and share, and share the love, you know, share the prayer. So that is uh, a song that just reminds us of how this, that unconditional love. You know, we are our, our ancestors, but we are each and every one of us is part of nature. Because us one drum sisters have uh, and can drum until the morning. <laughs> so we want to be respectful of everybody's time and when it's needed because I don't know, we have down the sunrise. So you let us know if you would like us to continue singing some prayers or if you want to take a little break. Um, it's time. Okay. Can we do one last song like this? One last song. Not our last song. Not our last song ever. So no, no, we're right tomorrow we'll be, we will be here. Yeah, we have tomorrow. Yeah. 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 tomorrow. Yeah. 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 Um, but the last song that we'd like to share, um, and we just we share it in a way of hope. To so know that what we speak is of hope. So our last prayer is for the missing and murdered indigenous women, NMIW. Please, if you can, take a look, ask questions, get involved, um, see what you can do. So we sing our prayers for them and we remember their names. And not just for indigenous women, we're talking about all women, all women around the world. And we also pray for the men that are perpetrating these crimes. We pray for them to come into healing of the spiritual language. So we always close with this hope that we bring our sisters home. So this is called the Red Warrior Song for um, the uh, Red Warrior or just Women Warrior Song. And I was taught this song by Rose Henry from Canada. Us California natives also have a song that sounds a prayer that sounds very similar. murdered indigenous women. I thank you, Rose Henry, for bringing this forth for us to allow us to sing this medicine and bring that awareness for our sisters. May they know that we will never forget them until they all come home and we will be always for them, remembering their name. Keeping them in prayer, raising sacred smoke, and asking others to get involved. And may the media start asking questions. May the media start visiting that the women are being taken. Help us with that. This is our prayer of hope. So I don't, we don't end in a way that it's pretty, we end in a way of hope. Because I know without question that together that we can make a difference. I know our sisters, you're our pair of the eagle. Here we go, sister. Who would like to start? Who's going to start us?
Thank you for being with us on this journey. Thank you for allowing us to share our good medicine. And you are our medicine as well. And we thank you for being here. And I thank Creator for singing you all into being and for the work that you're doing. Oh. Oh. Thank you for joining us for these two days. I am blessed. Yes, thank you. Now we all get to eat. <laughs> so I have one more I, wanted, I do want to say there's like four or five different entrees. Uh, marinara, pasta, oh, rivera, stir fry, and salad and black bean enchiladas. It's more than black enough food. food. Oh, right. uh, all we're asking is that you take, you take a cup, we have like, you know, limited cups. We want to have you put your initials on it with Sharpie, trying to be green and not just or recycling too much. You get your cup and you can hold on to it for the evening. That would be great. And in a few minutes, we're going to really done singing and we're going to uh, perform some more music. So much love. Thank you so much for coming out. <laughs> Okay, we're going to switch over to a film now. In enough room, stand up straight, stand up proud. One drum. 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 One drum.
Hello and welcome to uh, Solutionaries, one of our media shows that we produce through the Earth Stock Foundation. I'm your host, Michael DiMartino. I hope you're all. Big energetic events coming up, including the May 14th full moon, the full flowering moon. The world is you know, glad to be here, uh, continuing to uh, bring conscious content to all of you. Uh, as you know, Solutionaries is a show where we don't just talk, but we actually introduce people and we give them a platform to talk about the amazing work and solutions that they are implementing in a broken old paradigm as we transition to a whole new way of being. And sometimes a new way of being. Uh, we heavily embrace uh, traditional knowledge and um, the wisdom of many different indigenous cultures, but we also work a lot around uh, environment, health, ecology, and, and green energy. So I'm really happy today to have time to uh, not only have a, uh, an interview with her, but also to announce that we're going to be offering a series of classes uh, that she'll be presenting in May, but I'm really happy uh, and honored to have uh, our next guest on the show, Marza Millar. So welcome, Marza. Hi. Nice and, to uh, see you as always. Good to see you. And I, and I really appreciate um, our evolving and developing friendship. And uh, just to give people a little idea about yourself, that uh, Marza Millar, also known as Grandmother Two Clouds, is a spokesperson for the children of the future with messages from her ancestors from the past. So I didn't know you were also a poet. That's a great, great line. <laughs> and um, Marza holds the wisdom of her father's medicine ways, teachings from uh, his ancestors. And currently, uh, where I know her from in Nevada City, or what I call Nirvana City, mystic medicine woman, wisdom keeper, and ceremonialist. Uh, she also owns the Ancient Earth Apothecary, the School of Energy Medicine, and the Church of Essence. So, So, um, welcome. It's really an honor. To be here today. Yes. Yes. As a fellow world traveler, uh, I'm mystified because one day I'll talk to you and you're at Stonehenge, and then the next day I'll talk to you in Hawaii, and then you're down in uh, your ancestral uh, areas of Sedona, and then another day you're on the East Coast. So yeah, you're doing a lot of movement. And um, I think in the time we have today, you're, you're gonna be offering. But um, how do you find all these things come together in a transformational time on the planet? I mean, obviously, you're doing important work, but there seems to be a 
a heightened sense of urgency right now that humanity is in with this uh, prospect of self-preservation. Exactly. I totally agree, Michael. Um, <clears throat> I'm a retired RN from my time out of medicine. I was raised in better ways since birth through both my parents um, in the also in the Jewish ways, Celtic ways. And, um, my father grew up in Sedona, Arizona at the turn of the century. And starting to be trained when he was six and that was in 1960 and um they belong to um they belong to one of the um mystery schools actually started with the Siberian Yupix up in Alaska for many years, um, working with the Inca who were hosting Mount Shasta. I worked with them for 12 years. The Hopi elders, we do a lot of work. We just finished a bunch of work together in Sedona. And working with these indigenous leaders um, that come to my home and stay with me a lot and plus the different places that I interact with them um, <clears throat> is the prophecies and understanding I've been studying prophecy starting with them you know prophecies such as the lions I spent 20 years in study at yeah Ninety-seven, the Hopi elders brought the thing Harold in this time. My father was also very well aware of it. With the with that council and with that reservation, and working with a young woman in kind of giving her some medicine ways that were lost with the elders that have all passed away that was passed to my dad and then so it's kind of common but to understand all of the is now we've come to a place in where, and, um, my father was um, involved in what's called the emergent store of an area that where they came up after the third world flood is where the, the indigenous people came up and, and populated the southwest and actually did the world's migration connections to Hopi as well as that in the ancient people of the Singhua Valley and Verde Valley that whole area so with that I completed my training with my and in 1997 after doing that ceremony and the temple there are big islands it was very apparent to me that the indigenous people were very very involved in, in the times that were coming um, in 2010 literally the Inca came to my front door, literally. Um, and that was through other connections. But they were coming forward in the Sierra Nevada City. They were coming forward because they are all 
not having that urgency. Um, spending time, a lot of time, seven years up in St. Lawrence Island and up into the Arctic Circle, working with a lot of the Inuit in Siberia. They have their prophecies, and um, it's called Two Winters. The Hawaiians have their prophecies. The Hopis have their prophecies. We have the Mahabharata. That those prophecies of the Hindu people. Then we go to, um, you know, more indigenous communities, and they're all pointing. You know, um, they're all pointing to this time of now. They're all pointing to this place that we're sitting that is extremely important. And, you know, I never thought I'd be alive during this time, ever. I always thought that I would be, um, you know, maybe on my own journey at that point through the veil, but um, it's happened much more quickly. Um, things started a lot, the lining back in 1997 as a warning. 2012 was one of the first gateways that we went through. And then there's a thing called 2020 prophecies that into this next decade that we're in the time of the shaking from 2020 to 2025. We are in the time of the shaking or the winnowing. And we're seeing that. We're seeing that we're seeing that we're having you know factions that are they're splintering and we're seeing that splinter all over the world and the other thing that's so important is as we entered the 2020 gates uh we not only had covid but we also had on january 3rd of 2020 when the u.s did aggression with iran by killing their military leader of course january 6th we had the um, overtaking of the capital, and now we're we're into 2022. Um, we have the Ukraine and Russian war. Right. So we, and, and 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 also, as you know, a crescendoing of a solar flare activity. We have solar right. dimming. If we look back uh, just over a decade ago, the white buffalo prophecy, a whole series of white buffaloes being born. Uh, you know, all of these things that are happening right now, like you said, and this is really what I, when I love talking about you, because, you know, this is amazing information, but more than just information, these are actually uh, prophecies and road signs to inspire and awaken humanity now. And, and now we're all talking about the quantum moment, quantum consciousness, quantum reality. Right now we create the future. So I know a lot of people have become very apathetic or very depressed about what's happening in the world. And I, I love talking with you because, I mean, you're out there doing it. We're out there doing it. We're trying to inspire people to co-create a positive future and don't buy into all the, the negativity, the propaganda and the toxic broken timeline that's kind of being pushed through corporate media, the whole doomsday um, scenario, which is interesting because someone the other day said I'm, they called me an apocaloptimist. So like it's the apocalypse, but you're so optimistic. That's a good it's like, one. That's it's a like good that's because I see a brighter future, but we all have to join together and collaborate to make it the future that we want for ourselves and our children and seven generations to come. So uh, again, I want to uh, applaud you and also just add to that that so many of these things are happening. That now is the time we are the ones and we have to create the world and co-create the world that we want uh, to see in the future for us. Well, it's interesting because we have one rising and one falling and they're happening simultaneously. And so there is hard to find solid ground, truly where our feet are, are fitting because you get comfortable at one moment and it becomes uncomfortable the next moment. But that's good. And if we follow the prophecies, um, right now we're living what looks like because you also look at the Pluto Uranus transits and you look at all the way through from, you know, all the years of the wars and the new inventions and the wars and the new inventions. They all happen sim simultaneously during these really unique transits. But it's not just the transits I'm going on. I also read cycles and signs and patterns and look for those those markers within history and the repeating of those markers. And right now, I would say that we're living um, actually in 1939. You know, we and we're still headed for more um, economic unrest. 
where, um, you know, and there, there's a possibility of World War III um, if this escalates anymore. However, we have to shake until we're done shaking to come together. And meantime, we can do the foundational work to bring that rise into a faster manifestation on this earth plane. It's all that knowledge is already in the Akashic records of the earth. And it's also sitting with the indigenous cultures that have been around for thousands of years and it permeates. We also have these sacred sites that we have the ability to bring some of these back online. I've been working a lot in Egypt and the temples of Egypt and working with people um, with um, different energies that they're doing different um, things that are able to work within some of the portals and constructs of the multiverse. So with that said, um, it sounds a little bit um, woo I guess we'll just call well, it. That, 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 well, I mean, look, even if we look in mainstream media, like the Marvel films and the film Endgame, right. were snapping half of existence, you know, uh, you know, half of humanity out of existence. I mean, all these things, it's like, no matter where we look, the, the stories might be subtly different, but the mythology is there, the media, it's all there. the film, everything right now is pointing to this incredible uh crossroads between and again i know in the hopi tradition they say are you a one heart or are you a two heart are you a one heart who's walking uh in a good way aligned with your spiritual mental physical and emotional bodies towards a greater truth or is it like well i'd like to do that but i'm kind of over here too busy making money and then i got to go over here and do this and i have to and that people are really becoming uh, almost like spiritually schizophrenic because they're so split between all these different priorities and like the hopi say we have to become a one heart. We have to bring all of our fractured and fractal pieces of ourselves together to actually be a whole human being, to actually be aware enough to walk uh, in indigenous tradition, the red road, or to, to walk a spiritual path, to be able to walk these times of this Koyanis Katsi of the world out of balance and these earth changes. Exactly. Um, it's also to understand that we live in liquid time and we live in a liquid universe, meaning that everything has got different vibrations going on, not only the ley lines of the earth, the dragon lines of the earth, the earth Schumann resonance, which is actually the photonic light coming into the earth and how it resonates back. And it's not just in on earth, it's also in our solar system and how our solar system is moving through the Milky Way through that 26,000 year cycle. And what's interesting, we alive on planet earth in 2012 took in an actual transmission from the great central sun that happens every 26,000 years. The great central sun is the black hole that actually made the Milky Way comes directly into us from our sun and understanding that people as our vibration rises with that knowledge and those transmissions and also the indigenous um, elders rising to give ceremony to enhance our vibration to be able to rise above of the chaos so that we can be more directed and also, you know, directing. All of my elders pretty much have passed. Um, I've been in training most of my life, almost all my life in medicine ways. And um, one thing I find interesting is that, you know, I never expected to be the elder of this time. I just, I never expected it. And I don't know if I'll ever be an elder. And I, I don't know if that's even a title that I'm worthy of. You know what I mean? But everyone that ever came to me that taught me what they taught have now passed except for two. And, um, you know, it's hard looking because I always look to somebody else and now I have to look at me and what they deposited within me to give away. And um, I've been teaching medicine circles here in the city and vision quests and, and drum circles and shamanic journey work and shamanic medicine 
and vibrational medicine, energy medicine, herbalism. I've been teaching that for, you know, involved in it for 40 years. of light because a lot of the prophecies say what is above shall come below and what is below sorry about that what is below shall come above and so we're having this this rise and fall at the same time but we're also working with interdimensional energy and frequencies that are coming in and there's a lot of if you go back to um the the actually ancient biblical text and then you put that into the like revelation in the biblical context then you go go to pyramid text the ancient pyramid text and i've been doing a lot of study um over the last few years it one you know actually in egypt itself at the egyptian museum in san jose that has an ancient library with ancient books then also doing study and overlaying all of these things and realizing that these energies rising and falling, that they're, they're a frequency of light and how we move through the gradient of life or vibration and how do we take that on to deflect those things, that dense energy that's trying to sit on us, as well as the dense energy that's come, that is been propagated by everything and there's a way of standing as spiritual warriors and that has been really my my get of getting that information out there as it's been coming to me i mean it caused me to um sell my house of 15 years in downtown nevada city take what equity i had and put it into these teachings and a lot of this and had to relocate um, into a different situation. So I had more liquidity knowing that we were having, it seems like, you know, I who knew about COVID, but you know, we all had financial setbacks with COVID and then moving forward and everything that, that is ca it's causing, you know, we're headed into another depression. We're headed into the highest inflation. And if you look at these repeating patterns, they're here. So people need to get solvent with their with their gold, with their silver, not put their money in paper. And there's things we need to do in our lives to move forward. And that's what this class is about, is how to prepare yourself not only spiritually, but emotionally, mentally, and physically for what we're facing and what is coming in, in the next wave ahead of us. Absolutely, and we're excited because uh, the Warriors of Light walking in these times of prophecy workshop, um, I know we're gonna be starting uh, in just a couple of weeks. That's gonna begin on Wednesday, May 4th, and we're looking at doing it as a five week class. I know one of the classes we're gonna be showing uh, some other related media and video and stuff. I think we're gonna show Koyan Eskatsi um, but we're going to be having the um, the blessing of having time with you on Wednesdays from 6 to 7 p.m. Pacific time, where we can uh, listen to you uh, share some of your amazing wealth of knowledge and tradition and teachings. And, and also maybe at the end, have a little time of some Q&A, because uh, again, I know that a lot of people are being activated. And you said we're heading into a, an, another depression, but we're also heading into another dimension. Yeah, and, uh, and all sure. of us are really co-creating that. So kind of like sharing that fire of what I call galactivation with each other and hearing these words and getting the affirmations. I know for myself, I'm I'm the same way being in Nevada City, uh, focusing on, you know, moving out of the, the hub uh, and becoming more fluid because a lot of what I'm doing right now is helping to set up what I call these arcs which are these academies for regenerative culture. And you can kind of picture the Ark of the Covenant like these golden arcs, which is kind of an energetic symbolic thing of the Ark of the Covenant and going out into the desert. But we're, we're looking at networking existing land bases together with uh, establishing a 40 acre center in Crestone, Colorado, which is an amazing place of uh, accelerated activation. It's known as the Bloodless Valley and has been a place of sacred pilgrimage for many years and connecting with people in Boulder and Sedona and Taos and Santa Fe. So it's exciting to be out there, but also 
since I've been out there for eight months, coming back to California, and now uh, this weekend is Earth Day, being asked to do Earth Day of all places in Los Angeles, uh, being here in Santa Cruz right now, and then also meeting people in Nevada City where I live that are doing the work and are creating these foundational places and then spending Easter in Mount Shasta. So like you were saying, all these places of this matrix, whether it's here in, on Turtle Island in North America or in Egypt or, or Peru, that all of these sacred places, all of these dragon lines and ley lines are being activated and coming back online. So it's a very dynamic, exciting, activating time and really looking forward to this upcoming workshop with you because uh, this is really some of the most pertinent. And, and I just want to say in doing this, we're not trying to add more information to this whole, gen I mean, I call it the information saturation generation. I mean, there's so much out there, but I think um, what's really happening is we're going to cut to the chase and really get down to uh, the reality of what's happening and hopefully inspire and get people activated so they can become uh, even a more exactly. conscious part of this transformational time. That's why I'm offering this work and like I said um, I have a beautiful medicine wheel I was out there yesterday and um, working um, it's on 160 acres in Nevada City and Deer Creek runs through the middle of the property and the thing is I was out there working with the elementals and really getting some downloads you know and really understanding how how do we break something without totally breaking ourselves and how do we prepare ourselves for something that is breaking so that we're prepared as as it rises at the same time that's the trick and so it's something it and it's the regen regenesis you know of revisioning ourselves and really our connection to to creator i mean nothing is more powerful than prayer at least in my life and um, I find going to spirit, there's, and, you know, there's been plenty of messages left for, from us, from the people and the visionaries from thousands of years ago is written on the rock walls, the acoustics in the ancient temples and how the earthworks of the advanced civilization that was destroyed 12,600 years ago, there's still signs and everything and, and bringing that all into we need to have that ancient future to rise and well, it's, that's it's, what i'm working on and it's interesting because uh, i just saw an article about where they found a thirty-five thousand year old city off of southern india which they, you know is traditionally oh, yeah. the location of lemuria and uh, so right there, just that one event alone is already rewriting the history books of like, well, we've been here for 20,000 years and we came across the Bering Land Strait and we were like, Neil no, there's like very ancient evolved uh, civilizations that were actually related to the Tamil, but also in, uh, I think it's called Tepe, Tepe, Tepe Yeke in South America, the, the huge stone temples they've been finding and yeah. the mountain craftsmanship and engineering. So again, um, you know, the stories are being revealed, the prophecies are coming out, the truth is being told, and it's just a really exciting and dynamic time to uh, be here on the planet, to be a bridge between the old and, and the new, and you hit the nail right on the head, it really is an ancient future. Um, we don't have to recreate things, there's a, a no. amount of traditional indigenous uh, knowledge out there in the world, and what we have to do is adapt and, and innovate that in a way that is practical and work uh, in this mo modern time to actually help us even have a future. So I know you have uh, folks showing up in a few minutes. I don't want to take too much of your time, but I do want to really encourage people to watch uh, your uh, Warriors of Light um, workshop. We'll be starting it for five Wednesdays, starting the first Wednesday of May. Really excited to have this discourse with you today and to help kind of promote that. And it's going to be incredible. I'm really looking forward to it. And it's so timely. So uh, many blessings to you and uh, any last few words of uh, inspiration or wisdom you can leave us with before we wrap. I just want people to know is put on your seatbelts, buckle up, because we're going, you know, we're already going for a ride, but it's going to speed up. So, um, and to know that we're in the time of the shaking. So if things feel a little odd or doing that, just stay in your faith, stay with spirit, stay in your prayers, stay in your ceremonies and, and just plan ahead and just be part of the evolution because that's where we are. The evolution is the revolution. 
Absolutely. And, and unless you're becoming a breath area and know where your food and water comes from. Exactly. And, and, and like the hope you say, it's a time to look around and find a uh, connection in other people's eyes and to lash our canoes together as we all go towards this great waterfall of transformation. So exactly. uh, much love and appreciation, Marza Malar, and thank you for your time. Uh, honored anytime we get to share space together and, and, and to um, add to the global coherent field because this is some of the most important uh, subject matter that we can really be focused on right now. Um, and there's a lot of distractions in the world. So it's time to, you know, not be distracted and keep our kind of eye on what's really happening and be part of the change. Exactly. Thank you so much, Michael, and, and be well. And, and everyone that hears this message, just be well. Fantastic. All right, we'll be talking in just a few weeks. Uh, I know every okay. day is Earth Day, but have a great Earth Day weekend and uh, too. Day travels. Okay, bye bye. If you see this plant in your backyard, don't step on it. This neglected plant is more delicious and nutritious than most garden plants people care for. If you pull out this weed to protect your crops, you throw away something much more valuable. Calorie for calorie, purslane is one of the most nutrient-dense foods on earth. It also has a concentration of omega-3s compared to any leafy green vegetable. On top of that, you can take advantage of its anti-inflammatory properties by turning it into a poultice. This is just one of the many neglected plants that might be growing in your backyard. Plants that not only can save your life one day, but that you can put to good use right now. If you know these wild plants, you will never run out of food, no matter what the future brings you. Today, I would like to show you some of the ignored plants that every person should know. So pay close attention, as one day you may need one of them. During the Great Depression, it was plants like these that fed many Thank Americans, you, saving kids. Uh, so we're here, we're getting festive, and uh, it's been a amazing day. Happy Earth Day, everyone. And uh, in a few minutes, I'm going to get on to uh, Azo with Bob and Heidi and some of the people from the uh, Sacramento area. So I'll play another short video and we'll be back with lots more. And, uh, let's, let's see what we get here. So hope you're having a blessed uh, Earth Day. Every day is Earth Day and just celebrating the beauty and the abundance. It's been a really inspiring day down here in Thousand Oaks, uh, California. And I uh, just want to thank everyone for showing up, all of the sponsors and all the supporters. And uh, I got to jump on to another call. The night is not done yet. So, um, here we go. The what? The holographic thing. Yeah, I'll be right in. You should do it yourself, though. Okay, no, I said, do you, were you the still going to do the remaining people the listen? But why don't you do your video thing first? I got to okay. keep the stream going. Well, Michael, what's the streaming going on? We can get you in the yeah, Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Well,
The Sacramento River Watershed Project is a nonprofit organization dedicated to preservation, education, and regeneration of our most precious resource, water. The organization works in a dozen counties in the watershed, ranging from the glacial waters of Mount Shasta to the unique estuary of the Sacramento River Delta. We are committed to focusing on three main issues, stopping and removing environmental toxins, including herbicides, pesticides, microplastics, and pharmaceuticals, working with decision makers to prevent mismanagement, and working to prevent privatization and the devastating impact to our communities and the environment. For more information, go to www.sacramentoriverwatershedproject.org or call 530-362-8264. Thanks for calling. Let's see what we get here. Bear with me. plugging it into my computer and it wasn't showing. Well, I had it coming out of here. It wasn't showing. Yeah, I'm still streaming. We're, we're doing a few technical things here. Bear with us a minute. Yeah, because I, I tried getting it going on my camera and I, it wasn't going. Hey, are you on there? Okay, I'm, I'm trying to get on. I keep saying you're early. Double check your invitation. So I keep going. So I'm. Okay, I'll be on in a second. Is Bob there? Bob is there. Anyone else? Okay, all right. I'll um so not the one you sent me okay so can you text me the address it's hard for me to hear here there's a big yeah, crowd I will text you right now. okay thanks we're gonna probably back it up and go uh, you're not going to just leave it till the morning? No, no, no. We're leaving it till tomorrow. I'm just going to take my guitar and leave everything set up. Okay. Right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. The sacrament. You're trying to run the projector from this computer? Yeah. Well, we have to do uh, screen mirror. I know I did all that. I, I've done it before. It just wasn't working. Huh. Okay. Let's go over to another screen share here. Let's see what we have. Michael what? So I think this one is a 
Everything will be happening here tomorrow. It'll be pretty straightforward. Right, so let's see if, see if you want to get the, you can get the power on. those LED bulbs. Billy, can I get that plug? Billy, can I? Yeah, please. Okay. Great. We're going to have to recharge this for tomorrow. Yeah, I'll plug it in. I'll plug it in and tell me what. Michael, Michael, plug it in so I can get some volume work. All right, there's no volume coming out yet. Okay, so. Okay. That's the volume. Perfect. I've got like a uh, I just have to go to a loo. I'll be right back. All right, no worries. Oh, 
of course. Okay. So an hour and a half drive. Of course. And then we'll be here tomorrow before 12. Yeah. Yeah, we'll so start at noon. Well, we said 11 just to so, makes total okay, sense. Absolutely. I'm going to be last hey, now. So, so, so I went on that link. It says mobile support. It's, it's weird. I don't know what's happening. I think because you sent it from a phone, it's saying mobile support. See why? Uh, okay. Well, just type it in. Okay. I'll, are you in your computer? I'll, I'll read yeah, it to you. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Okay. HTTPS. Yeah. Uh, forward slash slash. Forward slash, okay. Join. Okay. Dot. Dot events. Okay, events. Okay. Forward slash Earth. Forward slash Earth. Underscore day. Oh, oh my God. Day. Okay. Underscore. Okay. Underscore. Okay, let's see what happens. And Laura in here chatting, like there's people with bombs in here now. We got Clyde it in just here. Say, it just says we currently don't support mobile tabs. Yeah, you can. Computer on Chrome, it doesn't make any sense. It's not working. What is it telling you? We currently don't it's support just... tablets or mobile devices. Oh, weird. That's okay, the, li I would close. the link you sent me is saying the same thing. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know why it's doing that. I think you should just email me a link. I did. I mean, that's the link. Right? Okay. All right. I'll I'll try it again. Okay. Wait. Wait. Try closing. I know. I just did that too. Shit. Like all the way down, not just the tab. No, I I did. Oh shit. Okay. Because we're in here, so that's weird. Okay. Hold okay. On. All right. Hold on, guys. Okay, thanks. All right. What's that? Oh, th we're about to take on uh, California for the uh, uh, eco side of water. There's like a lot of big stuff. This will be more tomorrow, but there's a lot of big stuff happening right now. Yeah, two gigantic tunnels. Yeah, they want to take six percent of the water out. It's one of the things I love so much. It's on my computer. I've done it multiple times. You know, what? what? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I did. I typed that one in manually that you gave me. Incognito. Right, Bodie will just be here. 